Welcome back to the Fast Life Podcast, which is brought to you by Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. There is no mistaking a Simpson out on the road. Their iconic, aggressive style has always stood out amongst other helmets. With many different models, finishes, and visor options to fit your taste, head on over to SimpsonMotorcycleHelmets.com, check out what they got, and get yourself set up with a badass helmet. And give them a follow on Instagram at Simpson Motorcycle Helmets. On today's episode, we have Yaniv from Power Plant. You guys might have heard of them or might might even follow them on Instagram. They have some of the sickest bikes out there from the choppers he's been building for the last 20 years all the way up to the FXRs and even Dynas he's put out that's really sick. His style is iconic. He's a fabricator. He's a a creative uh, in 100% aspect of the word. So really stoked to have him on. want to thank him again for doing this, and I hope you guys enjoy it. But before we get into this, we got to listen to these sponsors, and then we're going to jump right into this episode. House of Harley Davidson, located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, has your HD covered with the performance upgrades we all want, along with service, sales, and a stacked parts department. Head on over to houseofharley.com, where you can order the parts you need for your bike, along with all the best gear and clothing available. Drop the Fast Life offer code to save yourself 13% on your online purchases and give these guys a follow at House of Harley on Instagram. Lexan Moto is my Bluetooth headset company and has been for over three years now. The quality and sound and battery life make those long days on the open road much more enjoyable. Their latest headset, the G16, is designed to make group rides much better with a 16 rider comm system, Bluetooth 5.0, music sharing, and fast USB-C charging. Among the many things Lexan does for our motor community, they also offer the best customer service in the industry. The team at Lexan just dropped their new Lexan Smart Tire Pump as well, which is a portable tire pump that can fit easily in your saddlebags. Check out Lexan-Moto.com to see all the awesome products, which are all designed to make life on two wheels better. And don't forget to drop the Fast Life offer code at checkout to save yourself 15%. And lastly, give these guys a follow on Instagram at Lexan Moto. Thunder Max and their ECM computers are designed to provide your EFI-equipped Harley-Davidson with the most advanced auto-tuning on the market. And they just released their modules for the 2021 and up HD models. A Thunder Max ECM eliminates tuning hassles when upgrading your exhaust or air cleaner or when adding a cam or big bore kit. Thunder Max is also in the suspension game with their iRide rear suspension. This is a performance air ride which gives you the ability to adjust many aspects from the handlebar mounted touchscreen. This rear suspension is the best of both worlds. Check out these products at shoptmax.com and use offer code FASTLIFE to save yourself 10% off and follow ThunderMax EFI on Instagram. I have been riding with Lucky Dave's seats and handlebars on almost all my bikes since 2016, and I'm happy to announce their partnership with us here at the Fast Life Podcast. Their seats have always been the perfect fit for my ass, and with that trademark styling that I have come to love from the LD brand. Lucky Days also has some of the most dope handlebar options from their classic San Diego bar to their Peacemaker bar and riser combos. They got what you need. I'm personally running the Peacemaker bars on both my T-Sport and Bagger. Head on over to LuckyDaves.com to check out all of their options for your HD and grab yourself some swag while you're there. And lastly, give my guys a follow on Instagram at LuckyDaves. Now, here we go with Yaniv from Power Plant Motorcycles. Let's go. Hey, guys. You ready to let the dogs out? Fast Life Podcast. What are we talking about, food? Yeah. <laughs> What's the... So, well, first off, uh, introduce yourself to the uh, microphone there, sir. My name is Yaniv. Um... Yaniv Evan is my last name's Evan, and I uh, am the owner of Power Plant. Mm-hmm. I started it in 2002. Uh, it was just more of a passion project for motorcycles. Mm-hmm. Like, thought I'd just be able to have a shop to do stuff for fun. Like, I, yeah, it was kind of a dream to to do that, and it became a full business without even really trying. Without trying, yeah, yeah. And uh, recently got into performance, like in the last six, seven years. It was really chopper yeah, based. Yeah. Uh, very bare bones, like fuck everything, how everybody does it. I want to do it my way kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then um, kind of naturally fell into a market of pro- 
producing parts, which was basically uh, our drag sales rep. Mm -hmm. You Pushing know, you. he came by and he's like, "I love these risers you're hand making. Like I could sell the piss out of these." He's like, "I could sell this shit all, all day." And then that kind of stuff kind of motivated me to like, because I always had the mentality of like, they want that kind of shit, they can order it online. There's other people that do that. This, this yeah. is handmade, one of a kind. No two are like anywhere in the world. That's kind of yeah. like my mentality. I didn't want anyone to ever feel like they got something that I made for someone else. Mm -hmm. But with those risers, it really became a big. Uh, I started with risers, it became like a thing, you know, and then um, I realized how many people are actually doing yeah. that to their bikes. I thought it was like a small thing in our circle, um, riding those, you know, club style bikes. A few of my friends rode them. I always thought they're hideous too. I always thought they're like, you know, dirt bike bars with tall risers. That look was kind of like, my babe. Yeah. Um, was kind of like the, I'll see you later. Um, it's like a look that didn't really work well. Mm -hmm. Until I saw it with a fairing one time, I was like, mm -hmm. okay, now I, now I dig it because the yeah the twelve fourteen inch tall bar, uh, risers kind of make more sense with a fairing. It was a weird thing. Yeah, I still can't believe we're selling so much risers. It's just like, where are they going? But people are into it. Well, I would imagine and it feels good. Yeah, for sure. I, I would imagine like you know because like you said, this is twenty years in this location here on Melrose essentially. Yeah, twenty years ago, the bike scene was a completely different world. You know what I'm saying? Like the style of bikes people were building. But I feel like how were the bikes that you were building back then or when you first got into this? And actually, what what pushed you to even open the shop in the first place? Okay, let's talk about how it even started. Was um, I, I just had a day job. I was working. I used to work uh -huh. in the aircraft field. And then before this even happened, I was working in production. I was a, a grip and doing commercials and uh, yeah, yeah. motion picture and got into that because just because it was good money and it was hands-on yeah you know you get to have tools i always need to work with tools yeah. and stuff like that gotta have it's part of me yeah but uh to be quite frank i was i was growing and selling marijuana so i had money coming in <laughs> and i loved knuckleheads and panheads at the time that was my thing i just loved old i mean it started yeah. with triumphs but triumphs led to shovels and knuckles and pans and that's kind of what i wanted to do and i was able to go and apprentice at, at a couple shops i always mm -hmm. Like, if I do something, I don't want to be like, oh, I just got into it yesterday. I know this, like, people used to say this, like, you know, he's a newcomer, like, this oh, yeah. and that about guys who just enter a scene. Newbies. And, and you know, it's the same with skateboarding, BMX, everything that we grew up around. <clears throat> There's always that guy that just got in, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Or the guy that just bought, like, five surfboards who doesn't know how to surf. And I just, I, I'm not that guy. I, I like to get into the nitty-gritty. Mm -hmm. I like to know what the fuck is making this motor turn yeah. before I even want to ride the bike. And so that happened with Triumphs. And then, like I said, I got into Harley. Man, I need to rewind it. Let's go back a little bit further back. Mm -hmm. um, we used to go to this place called Bob's Big Boy. It's still uh -huh. there in Burbank. And every Friday, it's a, hot, it's a hot rod show. Yeah. So there'll be like the local cars and bikes. And that's where we would meet, whether you call. We didn't even have really iPhones or anything back then. But like, we just see the same people every Friday. And we'd hang yeah. and have good times and, you know, have a couple beers and look at cars. We weren't the guys that like put our cars there with the hoods up and all that, oh, but we yeah, always yeah. pull up and, and have our shit. And at the time, it was customs. I was building chop tops, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Model A's, 32 Fords, chop top coupes. We had, um, it was mostly cars, but I always had this thing for bikes. I rode bikes since I was like 10 years old. Yeah, yeah. I was always into motorcycles, just riding them. Um, and then one dude pulled up on a shovel head one day. His name was Mitch, Mitch Allred, and he was like a... a kind of a Bonneville guy he liked mm -hmm. he liked the salt flat shit yeah and he built a shovel head that was unbelievable and he's like yeah it was all drilled out everything was drilled the fender had holes and, and I'm like what's the deal with that he's like well they're lightning holes you know we we drill them out but he's like but I I saved all the pieces we drilled out and weighed it we'd like w the bike's like a hundred pounds less just oh shit just yeah. with these little you know because with, with the with the hole saw you get yeah, all the yeah. I'm like, oh, that's neat. I thought it was kind of cool, but it's like for for performance and actually for function. And that bike was just bad. And everyone always talked about that bike. And mm -hmm. one day I was like, man, I need to get one of these. And he's like, well, you can't get one if you don't ride it. And you got to know how to kickstart it. And he, and he goes, do you ride? I go, yeah, I rode my whole life. He's like, well, if you can kickstart this bitch, you can ride it. Mm -hmm. And it was embarrassing because everyone's around me. My mentor who talk, taught me about cars, he's there. He's an old yeah. man. His name's Jim Bruns. He's still around. It was kind of like him and this guy Gene Winfield were like building all the coolest cars. Yeah, I remember Gene. So him, yeah. I I used to work for Gene, 
And so imagine like those heads there. And I'm just oh, yeah. a 19 year old kid who don't know shit. Yeah, you got the master class then working under those guys then. So I'm like kicking, kicking, fucking thing fires up. I'm like, now you gotta ride it. And they're all <laughs> looking at you. And luckily it wasn't a jockey shift because yeah. <laughs> that would have been, been a problem. But it had a hand shifter. So I was like, oh, I got this. So I rode around, yeah. went around the corner, pulled over, kind of let my heart beat. And they're waiting for me. They're thinking I crashed or something. But I'm like, I'm gonna let them think but while i'm there i can really look at like what's going on yeah, on the bike. Yeah. i hate always being that guy all up on your shit mm -hmm. and back then there was it's different now you got instagram people see everything you're building yeah for sure but back then you had to see it in person even if it was in a magazine you can't zoom in and do all that right yeah. you're stuck with that one photo so here's the bike in front of me and i'm on it and i'm around the corner i pulled up in the gas station and these guys are all like where's your knee that and i'm just there like kind of trying to figure out the open bell. I remember the fucking thing was spinning open. And I was mm -hmm. like, this is amazing. I gotta get one of these. So when I pulled up, I had the biggest smile. They got worried, they're like, fuck, you wrote it. And I felt like I kind of earned a right to go get a Harley. Yeah, yeah. And I was still building a Triumph at the time. It was a Bonneville or something. That was really my first chopper. So then I got I got my hands on a shovel head and being that I had a little bit of extra money to play around with, if I like, had a good month, like, you know, <laughs> selling weed back then was illegal. So the money was good, Ben. I, it, it could be, you yeah. know. You could also get robbed, or uh, you know, by the cops or by the, you know, whoever. <laughs> so it was more dangerous back then. I feel yeah. like, and it still is today. But it's kind of how we grew up. We always had to watch our back. But man, when I got that that fucking shovel head, I was like, this is, this is it. And uh, I started doing it in my garage at home, and the neighbors hated me. And I remember like. When you need to fire it up, if it's mm -hmm. midnight and you just finished doing what you're yeah, doing, you're, doing yeah. you're firing it. If even if sometimes I push it down the street to the alley or whatever, but I fucking fired it. There's no, yeah. and the excitement is still here. You know, after mm -hmm. twenty something years, no matter what, but it could be a piece of shit sportster. Like we fire it up, that moment, the first moment is the best moment. It's like, yeah, well, it's I, what, I feel like that's why I do it. Yeah, for sure. After that, that's gone. It's like, all right, next. Now I gotta get that feeling again. Yeah, chasing the high. To the, the high. And so, so that was the, the first shovel head. And I remember opening that book, that trick tips you have. You remember that old book with the yeah. cartoons of how to wire bikes? And I remember like the ones you would get like like O'Reilly's and shit, the climbers oh, and oh, shit no, no, like no. that. I'll show you this one. This one's bitching. If you know old bikes, there's a book. And the dude, Robinson, used to draw all the shit for Easy Riders. He was like mm. a cartoonist. He drew this book and it's got wiring harnesses that oh, are hand drawn. They're pretty simplified. I, that's what I used to wire my first bike. You should post a photo of this book maybe on, okay. on your thing so people know what I'm talking about because you got to have it. And they have actually have a repop of the book now. Nice. You used to have to find an OG one. So they're remaking the book. But uh, it's got all the tricks you need if you're on the side of the road. It's not like the it's, it's not like the mechanic book that tells you how to do it right. It's to tell you how to do it wrong and to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he compares everything to like funny shit. Like, you know, tells you like, oh, before you go wiring your bike, first thing you do is get... You know, you need this, 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 and that, and then sit down, roll yourself a joint, <laughs> fucking get it done. Like yeah. that kind of shit. Talks about like sex in there and yeah. all these like every, you know, like old timers always compare everything to sex, right? Yeah. Every t you can't work at a shop and not hearing something about dicks or pussies constantly. That's <laughs> exactly. kind of like like this book, right? Yeah. It's a real biker, written by a biker who knows, and he's also a good artist, so it made sense. But that book fucking saved me. I wired my first bike, fired it up. And then I was like back at Bob's Big Boy with my Harley now. And it kind of worked its way where people knew me for cars. Yeah. Now I'm doing bikes. Same with Jesse and them. Like I used to go to West Coast Choppers. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, the dude with the, with the old Fords. And it's kind of like very innocent. But the minute you got into bikes, now they're like, whoa, whoa. Now you're building bikes. Like different territory. Like you're stepping yeah. on. It's like tattoos. Oh, yeah. Motorcycles, yeah. hot rods. It was weird. It was really weird. Some people How started changing on me. They're like. Now you're like building bikes, like kind of like not welcome here anymore. Mm, that makes weird. sense. I'm, you know, I, I've always been welcome out here as a painter, as a custom painter. All the painters out here like me, but if I lived here, I feel like we'd all have issues. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're probably right. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not like that. To me, it's like I'm motorcycle city. The more, the better. You want yeah. the whole world to look at us here. So like, if, if all the talent comes from one area, then that's where you want to be. Yeah, the but the more, the merrier. There's a place. Even, as, even knowing some of these other builders and stuff, like your style and, and what I've looked into the old school. This fucking guy. <laughs> it's all good. I, it's not bad. Is that good? Yeah. Looking at your style versus Jesse's style and even, you know, hasn't Gene Winfield kind of fucked with bikes here and there over the time? He did I feel some like paint jobs has. and some custom yeah. you know, molding and stuff like that. But, but I feel like, uh, you know, styles are, you know, 
that era of building bikes, even now, I mean, like I said, you, you found a way to take an FXR that most of us kind of do the same, you know, and put a flair to it that when you see it, you know, it's a power plant build, you know what I'm saying? And that's, I mean, I can't tell you how many times in, in my past FXRs, like I'm looking at yours and I'm like, fuck, that's it. That's what I want. You know, but I'm like, okay, how do I, how do I take inspiration from this? and run it through me and come out with something different that's not that but it's mine you know what i'm saying that's a good point yeah um i'll tell you like what um that that kind of how it works for me i'm trying to think while i'm saying it but i feel like you look at the bike and you go okay what is too bulky or what is too Mm -hmm. whatever too much whatever when they do the blue or like whatever they do the color sometimes it's overwhelming how can we Mm -hmm. modify it but to keep it in the OEM realm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I always love the original shit. I mean, if you think yeah. about it, man, like those old break arms on pan heads, like they have that weird, like banana shape. Like yeah. certain things like that is like kind of attractive to me. Same with FXRs. Mm-hmm. That's why I like FXRs is because you feel like you're kind of, it's the same feeling when I'm looking for knucklehead parts at the swap meet or if I'm looking for, you know, inspiration. It's like there's so much, to me, there's potential with the FXR. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't see it from far, but when you start touching it, when you Mm -hmm. start like stripping it down and you start learning like what it took to build, even for the factory to build it, like the handmade welds and all this like. Yeah, it's it's intense, yeah. Like, okay, this isn't some like production bike that Harley normally does. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the excitement part. Anything they made one year in Harley's notorious for this, like the paint jobs, especially like knowing by an emblem what year the bike is or if you're really nerdy you know mm-hmm. what the colorways are for that year mm-hmm. it's very interesting yeah did you ever get a one of the fxr bazaar books i did yeah that shit's the bible the yeah. bible is true it's it's there and um you never get enough of that book mm-hmm. um it's kind of genius that he did that actually yeah even for me who i claim i know a lot about fxrs and you read that and you're like whoa they only made this many that year like how the fuck did you get that information <laughs> I remember when he started working on all the all that work to to cr- produce that magazine or that book and yeah seeing it and he actually flew down to the studio in Dallas whenever he finished it to kind oh, of he was un- on the show yeah unveil it on the live podcast and uh, then he gave me one of the gold books and I was dude it was, short of almost wanting to shed a tear it was just dope to you know help promote him and he made all this stuff and him come on the show and give the book to me and he's you know, a G yeah dude Nick's the shit Nick so. is the shit I like Nick a lot. Yeah. it's like the the nerd i was just telling you about mm-hmm. he's that guy plus he knows the custom world he knows like i don't know if you know what he's built i'm not gonna say it but he's building some sick ass <laughs> fxr yeah. too which kind of like blew my mind i'm like wait yeah this yeah. exists people like that do exist like, they, mm-hmm. like the sky's the limit like anything works how much time you gotta spend yeah, to make sure. it work right and it, the book is a good example like he could have built a couple badass bikes but he put this book together you know it's kind of the same thing it's a mark on our scene for yeah. sure you know yeah. what i mean so yeah he deserves what he's doing for sure i'm glad um and f- what for me the fxr remind me of a chopper especially the stance with the mids and the high bars mm-hmm. it's like soon it, and i'll be honest it wasn't an fxr that got me into fxr it was actually a dyna that got mm-hmm. me there um i was i was uh borrowing a bike from a friend who was out of town he gave me the keys to his fxd and he's like dude you need to ride this this weekend blah 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 and i'm like fuck man i don't ride these bikes man they got too many switches and shit you know i was literally like everything's off switches yeah. everything's stripped down i don't even run i run internal throttle throttle cables because i don't even like throttles yeah um shit like that and so imagine i'm sitting on an fxd mm-hmm. it's got bags it's got it's got the worst got the motor the mcclooney yeah. the thunder header and I took this girl on a ride, and I'm like, wow, man, like, I've never had a girl be that comfortable on a bike, <laughs> you know? It's just like, nice, we're both comfy, going through the canyons. Mm-hmm. When he came back to town, I had to give him the keys back. I was looking for any reason to try to keep it one more day. And uh, I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to get one of these. So I almost went and bought a Dyna, and then my friend Jason Jesse was like, dude, if you rode a Dyna, wait till you ride an FXR. I'm like, I rode an FXR a long time ago. It was James Kahn's bike, mm-hmm. but it was built like 90s style. It was like, oh, kind yeah. of like low pro rider, street, yeah. pro street, yeah, a lot yeah. of billet stuff, heavy, heavy shit on there I didn't want. And that's kind of what I remember, I remember. from an mm-hmm. FXR. But the high bars and the mids, that's not what this bike had. So when I was going to buy a Dyna, Jason convinced me to go ride a friend of ours FXR, and I did. And it's, I was like, yeah, this day. is like the Dyna and the chopper. 
and the FXR and the, and the whole thing all yeah. put in one, in my opinion. And I saw some potentials to like trim the tank down. And, yeah. You know, I always hate the tail lights. I'm like, we always need to do something with like. Well, the lines on an FXR, especially with the exposed frame right under the seat, you know, the triangle, like all that stuff, it's just, it's grown into like almost like a chopper. Like you said, it's got a chopper flavor, but with a performance it's edge. You're and, sitting in that frame. Like yeah. That. With a chopper, you have that same kind of slope. Mm -hmm. And then with a fender picks up, is kind of where you're sitting. With the FXR, they brought the frame back up right around the I seat. I don't know if there's another frame other than like getting into no. the old pan heads and stuff no. that you can just put a frame on a, on a wall and it's like, fuck yeah, that's sexy. You know uh, what I'm saying? Rigid, a rigid knuckle yes, or saying. pen, yes. Yeah. Swing arm frames, no. me and you probably know the difference between some of them, but. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're still kind of hand welded back then, but when you see the. You know, you're thinking you're talking about '80s and '90s, and these things are still being hand, you know, yeah. fabricated. It was pretty neat. Yeah. And they can never, hardly can't afford to do shit like that anymore. Mm -mm. And and that's kind of what I always educate people on, like why you're buying an FXR is they'll never be made again. Even if they did, they won't be made this way. Yeah. And the and the fact that it's a roll cage versus a frame. Yeah, yeah, and, for sure. And when you're sitting, you're sitting in a cockpit versus a motorcycle. You know, because you're tucked in there. Um, I think the baggers have the, maybe the closest type frame. It's similar, but they run a subframe setup instead of just a, a one piece. You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's just that yeah. triangular thing under the seat yeah. that kind of reminds me of it, which could fool some people. Yeah, and I've seen people fall for sportsters thinking it's the same too. Yeah, but when you know how it's built, when you have a fr bare bones frame in your hand, then you're kind of like, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I got yeah. So back to that, Jason's like, go ride an FXR, and I and I did, and I didn't just buy one. I bought one, and right away I bought another one. Because the way I learn shit, and everyone's got their own thing, if you have two things there, and I learned this with cars, mm -hmm. when you're working on a car, and you can go, feel free to tear it all down, and now I know how to put it back together. If you have another one sitting right there, yeah. is the best way. So I took one apart and had an extra bike to like... Yeah, double check everything. Everything. And, yeah, I know like what you mean. Centering the motor was a bitch for me in the beginning. Like, yeah. you know, like the, even with a Dyna, you can really fuck things up if you don't adjust your, yeah. your motor centered. And so having that nice one to go and measure, and it was a factory one, a nice clean one. So that that is a trick too, man, for a lot of people. Like, yeah. you know, you're gonna take a fucking, whatever, radio part, have two of them, you know, because chances are yep. you're gonna have a hard time putting it back together. Now we have internet and shit, but back then it was kind of hard. So I, I, did, I did use that to my limit to go, like I said, like to go dissect something and learn to put it back together and how it's built. Mm -hmm. And it made me appreciate the FXR, and I was getting shit talked about a little bit. If it wasn't by outsiders that I don't know, it was my friends to my face were talking shit. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, sell out. Like, yeah. what, you don't, do you even know what a chopper is? You don't even build choppers anymore. And I'm like, come on, man. Like, those guys are doing it now. Everyone's what year was it same. when you decided to do the FXR? I think it was about eight, ten years ago. Mm. Time flies, but I, I want to say five, but it's been like almost eight, ten years, I think, mm -hmm. since the first one. And then it was like, okay, make risers again. Bend handlebars. Because that's how my choppers were built. I would bend the bars like, yeah, on the yeah. bender. And then it's like the same thing over and over. And I'm like, what am I doing? And then I got a guy to bend me handlebars. I got a guy to yeah. machine my risers for me. I was literally putting a set a week on. Well, at the same time, too, like when you were doing it originally, I think it was more just famous or well-known here in the SoCal area or even like NorCal, too. But nowadays, I mean chalk it up to whatever but the whole country is into this style of bike now you know what i'm saying the whole world yeah it, yeah you see the, the oh. club style japan thailand, thailand. <laughs> yeah yeah i was i was in thailand uh -huh. and i thought oh it'd be like what five guys here you know, it's a whole thing and For some real? of them got brand new bikes some of them got fxrs and they don't joke around the, yeah those they, guys go hard they have to be like oh the americans did that we're gonna do it better yeah and they do secretly the time. yeah well some of the best fucking painters in the world are out of japan right now Doing some wild shit, you know. Center roots, a couple other cats, yeah. uh, man, kings. Yeah, I try it, to, I try not to follow them because they just make me want to quit. You know what I'm saying, bro? It, it same for fabricating, man. Like, have you ever been to the show there? Uh, not Moon Eyes. Yeah, no, I haven't. Okay, mm -hmm. you need to go. So I grew up loving import cars. So I, used, my first time ever coming to California was, we would come out here and buy front clips from like Nissans and take them back to Texas and sell like the motors out of them to people that wanted to do the sr20 swaps and things like that so that was big too real big back in 01 that's what i was doing <laughs> now they're into ls's yeah everybody's putting L ls everything ls the world 
We were just talking about LSs last night. It's like the, to me, and not as big, but the twin cam conversion in FXR is an LS swap. Yeah. You know, you can ditch the fuel injection. You can keep it. You can, you know, <laughs> make it as simple as you want with wiring, or you can go yeah. crazy, and that's why I like it. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to uh, own a, a twin cam swap, but I think now if I was going to do another one, I'd probably just M8 swap it. Not that I would do it, but one of my good friends out of Dallas, uh, Corey, has main drive cycles. He's building one of the cleanest. Is M- he in Virginia City? No, he's in it's Dallas. Not the guy. No, no, no. Is he building it for the show of Virginia City? I wish he was because okay, I had talked about Someone's building an M8 that. for that show. There's one of the homies is building a FXR Pan America. So he's putting a Pan America motor in there. I saw that. Yeah. He, he was on the podcast a couple of weeks back before we left. Am Wild. I confusing him with the with the guy? So. Okay, yeah. so who someone already put an M8 in FXR? Yeah, there's. I, I think there's been two Was already. It Jeff Holt, maybe Jeff Holt did one. Danny did it. Yeah, well, Danny, Danny from uh, Motor Witch did it for Jeff Holt. There's been one more, but this one, and I'll show you pictures of it once we get done here. There, it it's looks factory, right? It he took an entire bagger, he fit the bagger swing arm, the new bagger swing arm. All the parts, it still has like original bag sparing, shit like that. He made it to where you can still run the wider back wheel by shaving the inside of the frame rails. Got everything, key fobs, all that shit on this bike. Looks factory. Key fobs. Everything. Fuel injection. Mm-hmm. Complete setup. It's fucking clean. He isn't done with it yet. He was trying to get it built, but he had a few uh, issues pop up. But he's he he's had it all. Genius. Mo- like yeah, that's dude, that's a fucking- lot. Because I'm like, okay, I like the heart, which yeah. is the the motor, but you gotta ditch the like harness and stuff i bet he cleaned that up too oh he cleaned it i'm sure but dude it's uh it's it's fucking nice man like he he wrote it to our we have a couple of events we throw every year he wrote it out to our camp out and uh he actually wrote it to a bike night first and i was just staring at was like dude like he even took he took the factory headers off the bike and then cut them up made it cleaner we welded it used the stock dude it has everything's from the original on it but he just kind of modified it to make it work on the fxr and uh, so you could walk up to it and be like, oh, shit, that's an, you might think it's a bagger with an FXR fairing swap and, a, and some clamshells on it. But then you, upon further inspection, you realize you're looking at an FXR. I sent it to the power plant page so you can look at it when you get a chance. Yeah, okay. it's wild. But no, I love that shit. Man. I, See, I think- and that's, that's back to your conversation about modifying. That's, that's what it's all about. Yeah. And back then they only had shovels to put in the pan heads because that was the newest technology and then you know then it got to the 80s with the evos and now where are we at yeah. is is eight valves you know it's just crazy <laughs> no it's rad Amazing. so so you know you started messing with the bikes uh obviously way before the fxr and the dyna thing what was that 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 spot that made you feel like okay i can afford to open up a spot and you know and then where does the power plant and where does that kind of come from you know the p16 what does that stand for you know um all right let's get back to that so we so how i got the shop was actually uh like i said it was kind of like a hobby thing i was doing i had money coming from different ways and then uh like the neighbors hated me over yeah yeah at the house so my buddy rudy you're gonna meet him he's around here he's like uh he's the early bird guy who goes to like people's shit and like sees a yard sale and like he just knows everything that's yeah anybody's got he knows there's a guy who has some old car in his backyard he knows about it yeah yeah he's like you got to see the shop get over here right now this place is for rent and it was right behind my house it was actually a two-car garage it was used as storage guy was getting rid of it, and i'm like this is perfect it was 800 bucks a month had a big gate i'm like neighbors aren't gonna say shit it's a commercial yeah and then uh uncle sam I had to I had to go do a, a commercial lease mm-hmm. and kind of had to create a business name mm-hmm. just for taxes and stuff. I had to do that. And I was like, "Fuck, this is scary, man!" Like I'm just like opening an LLC basically, and I started, you know, power plant. I called it power plant because I was really into old shit. And then back in the day, they didn't say motor or engine. They used the word power plant for like to, you know, to describe, c- yeah, c- like yeah, basically. And if you look in old Indian or Harley pre forties. Yeah. manuals and stuff it's referred to as a power plant mm. and so i'm like this is good because this doesn't say try it because i was still like do i like trying better than harley's do i like indians because i love all yeah. of them and i didn't want to specify that i build one yeah you didn't pigeonhole yourself so i was yeah. like this is called a power plant because really we start with a motor no matter what it is mm-hmm. you know and this is where it starts is the power plant so and i knew that it would be different things coming out of the shop so i i just thought it was a cool name yeah, yeah. and honestly it was just 
was sitting on the toilet reading a magazine. I was like, oh, <laughs> boom, power play. <laughs> LLC. Duh. Let's, let's get it over with. Duh. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, um, I don't know. It was just one thing after the other. Magazine. Back then, magazines were hot. So it was like yeah. every week we had a magazine shoot or we did some TV stuff. And people knew about us. It was weird. It was like we'd show up at shows and people were like, oh, I can't, mm-hmm. came here to see your bikes. And I'm like... I don't even know. Like, you know, I guess the magazine or the shows, they do their yeah. they do their work to, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm stuck in the garage. I have no idea. Even when I went to the first Born Free, it was like, hey, we're riding to the show in Long Beach. You want to go for a ride? I was like, what show? Yeah. It's called Born Free. Everything's free. They got free drinks, free food. I'm like, fucking let's go. We rode out there, and I was like, it was just a small little that garage. Lot thing, yeah. Just bitching. And then, you know, you realize, like, okay man like people have got eyes on this around the world they're starting to yeah and then when you start traveling the world you're like okay all right so they have their thing going on out here mm-hmm. you know i knew there's some stuff in asia for magazines i saw japanese vibes that magazine vibes uh they always did features on like indonesian bikes or stuff like that i couldn't read it, it was all like yeah you know? but but you can tell like this is thailand this is they would cover even, they would cover the Asian countries in their magazine. Even we, like the hot bike, J- J- Japan's hot bike was like a sick ass magazine. Crazy, so much better photography, so much better articles. Even though yeah, I can't read them or anything, but the pictures are just so much better in those things. And there's so much more of them. The magazines are those higher things quality. Were gold because the photos you'd get to like okay, article on the bike, article on the bike, okay, and then just pages of bikes that they just shoot mm-hmm. on the same background. So when they do an event, like everybody goes to like the backdrop and shoots the same photo with, diff- and you're just like, yeah. How many of these fuckers are building custom? And they're all by different shops. Yeah, yeah. And you're it's like, oh, okay, so they took the American culture and made it better. Or, yeah, yeah. And their head tried to do different, whatever. But they put their twist. In my on. opinion was better because it's all fresh. It's all new. Yeah. New They've things. always done that. I mean, speaking about Japan, music too, right? Yeah. Music, fashion. They they. Like what Japan did, like in the early days when I was in the imports, like we would get these uh, super street magazines and shit, and they see these cars that were featured over there, or we would get the magazines from there. The detail they would put in building, like a Nissan 240 or a Silvia, what it was over there, you just like sit there and like, oh shit, like this, we're outclassed with how much, like they're treating these things like they're they're treating a 240 SX like a goddamn Ferrari over there. You know what I mean? And same thing with the bike stuff, uh, lowrider culture, same thing, that, huge over there. That's been for, for, yeah, for a, a long time, yeah. So, ah, man. But I walked there to a show, and the, so they have, you know, Moon Eyes will have their section, and when they do the lowrider show, mm-hmm. you see these dudes, and their fucking hair, and their, <laughs> like, their outfit, it's like, dude, you're in East LA, 1980s, mm-hmm. better, like, per, like, perfect, like, everything, down to the car, down to the shoes. Yeah. It's cosplay. Whoa, whoa. It's crazy. When they're into hip hop, they're fucking Wu Tang. You know? When they're it's it's like they they just do it. They nail yeah, it. Yeah. That's awesome. That's crazy that uh I mean it's not crazy, it's it's understandable. I mean, like America's number one export's always been culture, you know what I mean? To the rest of the world. So it makes sense that certain areas would uh lean into it more and you know, just take it to another level, if you will, especially with their kind of precision and, and the way that they're just all brought up in general with their, you know, way of life. They uh, they focus more on details and whatnot, so. Yeah, I feel like things get ruined, though, with the internet. It does. Because nothing lasts too long. Like, this could have lasted longer. It could have mm, been, yeah. you know, just everything gets played out. Everything's, <clears throat> it used to be like a minute was like a long, like a like a quick video. Now, 15 seconds is too long. Yeah, yeah, it fucking sucks. Like, where's the details? Like, back in the day, you, like, couldn't wait to see something in person. But by now, people have already seen it. And Yeah. And I had this issue with, uh, I'm just going to say it, like, the beginning, like, Born Free 5 was when I was the invited builder. Mm-hmm. I had this issue with the with the guys, and um, they were like, you're not posting enough of your build. Mm. And I'm like, I don't come from that. I don't really, you'll yeah. see the bike day of. It'll be running. It'll yeah. be what I said I was going to bring. And they're like, no, it's not about that. It's about, this is a builder show. You got to show your build. And I'm like, I never really expose. It's like secret stuff. Yeah. Like how I make my gas tanks. Yeah. And I'm living in the old days. And now I realize what these guys are doing. They're ahead of the time. You know, Mike Davis and Grant, when they knew, they knew what they were doing. And I didn't. I, I was just like, this is my secret. I'll, yeah. 
I'll reveal the bike. It'll be under a blanket like the old days. Like, that's how yeah. we did it. And uh, people will see it in person. But no, not the whole world's going to be there. Half of them are just on their phone, yeah. you know, twice a day, and they want to see what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so I've learned a lot just from that experience, you know. And uh, and I felt like I was being kind of ar- arrogant, too, like not wanting to show it. And now it's like it, it's still kind of like something that haunts me. Like when I'm doing something, like, oh, you should take a photo and post. People want to yeah. see this, you know. But it kind of ruins it for me, too, because... I love the excitement of flying somewhere or driving to a show to just see it in person. See it in person, yeah. Spend time face to face. By then, the hype's already gone. You've already left your comment. You've already said what you had to say. You've already, <laughs> you know, same with like dating. Like people are like, you already know, you know, you're going to meet. You already, it's you already had that conversation through it's, on the dating app. Or it's just you get to be a pro at it by then. And like to me, it's all like the, the experience of meeting for the first time or seeing and and so when I get an opportunity like that, it's usually traveling, and traveling is kind of why it still keeps me going. Is like yeah, yeah. I get to go to different countries and see, you know, these shows. Like I'm supposed to be in Malaysia next two weeks for Damn. a bike show, and then we're going in November to Thailand. And then we have Indonesia in October. Mm-hmm. Damn. I don't know if I'm going to go to all of them, but I'm invited <laughs> this year because now they're back to open. They're, yeah. they're like shut down, so all these shows skip two years. How are those those kind of shows in those countries like that? Is it my just my favorite? Badass, my favorite, yeah. yeah. Because these guys don't have what we have. They don't have CNC machines. They don't have. Mm-hmm. There's no, you know. They're they're definitely inspired by what we do. Yeah. Except they're doing it with barefoot, with by hand, yeah. with a file, with a cutoff wheel. No, yeah. you know, no lathe. I mean, some of them have mills and lathes. I'm not gonna lie, but like a lot of them don't. Yeah. And you'd be surprised at what you can do, and it makes you realize, like, fuck, I'm lucky to have this cutting yeah, wheel. Yeah. I'm lucky to have. A, you know these snap-on tools and all this shit yeah, that we yeah. have these guys are using like some shitty ass tools they made and and the bikes look just as good <laughs> at yeah. the end of the day it's like a painting's a painting right yeah yeah what your brush looks like could be a feather it could be a fucking real you know thousand dollar brush but you're using whatever it is to get your shit fucking that's a good point man yeah that that would be amazing do you ever do any like of the europe ones like what are those kind of like when you go to the europe shows Eu- europe's on uh, it's it's a it's I love I love the Europe. I can't make up my mind if I like Europe better because my first shows were Europe before mm-hmm. I started hitting Asia, and so I got like France, Switzerland, Italy. Um, we went to Germany, and then there was one more place we went to the Alps. Um, like it was the country? It was, it was France, but we we did oh, a, okay. a, a South of France show. My friend threw in the fucking boondocks of France, and we rode. <laughs> We were, it was like the hillbillies of France. It was like you go to France every year to Paris and you think these are French people. But then you go to the country and you meet a fucking like a bunch of people from Houston. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's a different breed. Yeah. yeah. Almost like I like them better because we get along. I don't know. It's like we, we have things in common now. Yeah. Where in Paris, it's like these, you know, yeah. there's, they're into bikes. It's just weird, but it's two different people. Oh, yeah. So when yeah. we did the other French, I was like, man, I've been going to the wrong part of France for the last five years. <laughs> like, where have you guys been? These dudes are just like yeah, us, man. Party. Beards, fucking tattoos, the shittiest fucking rattiest bikes in a good way. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, they just know their shit, and they don't fucking care. They'll nice. sleep on the side of the road just like anybody I know. They're, and and But then when you stop for a meal, it's like... French bread and beautiful cheese. Oh, and yeah. Wine. They don't fuck around with the food. It's like, wait, these dudes got, like, they got it good. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, the, some of those European uh, trips were really, me- like, f- until forever. It just gives me a good feeling inside just remembering these roads. It's like riding through the Alps. I've ridden the Alps from three different spots. Like, we mm-hmm. came down from, you know, from France one time. We came up from Italy. And then we did a Switzerland trip. With, I don't know if you know Mario Burkhardt. He's, he does the leathers, MB leathers. He makes, uh, no, I don't know him. So he used to do this show. It's called. It's in Basel. It was a uh, Art and Wheels Basel, and he would invite builders, kind of like Moon Eyes does, but like more of like the hardcore guys. Like yeah, he's yeah. got uh, T Bone went. A lot of the guys we all know have been there, and uh, rather than put us in expensive hotels, we stayed at his house. And oh, that's cool. His wife would make us food, and sh- it, it, you get that like the local experience. Like yeah, yeah. But a lot of this, even they, they put us in a hotel. You get the red carpet treatment that you would never get if you had all the money in the world. But but a lot of them don't speak the language. But the one language we speak is when you say Star Hub or, yeah. you know, Magneto or yeah, yeah. these words of like people who work on bikes is yeah. the universal language that we found that we had together. Mm-hmm. And 
nothing else mattered the broken english or them not understanding me like the laughs are laughs real genuine yeah the food the meeting yeah. their families the just the whole road trip party some yeah. of these road trips were only two days some of them were five days but you be, you become friends with these people yeah. around the world and it just feels good and, and like you know when i'm going there this is where i'm going i'm yeah. not going to the touristy part because yeah no you, nobody wants to yeah if you can figure out where the locals go it's like you almost forgot what like because because i've traveled a lot before as a tourist it's yeah. like you know where am i going hey do you know where to like go see cool shit and so i could thank instagram for that too because yeah. you know people the best thing you can do is like picture your fucking your ticket right before you get on the plane yeah you know i'm gonna be right there and then you'd be surprised on people like oh i live there come yeah hit yeah. me up when you get there or hit you with recommendations places to go like, see yeah. eat things the like only that. people i know that could do that is rock stars people that are musicians who do tours that we used to like promote their tour is going to be in this town yeah. and, and yeah. so they would have that but like motorcycle builders like psh, never you never get that until we, you realize that you know these guys do an event once a year and they look up to us. They look up to Cut Rate. They look up to me. They look up mm-hmm. to like, all, obviously Jesse James and Paul Cox and all these like builders that I look up to. Um, when Indian Larry was around, I mean, this is like. How come like you never really got involved in any of the biker build off stuff, or did you have a part in any of that kind of stuff? I did. The, we did the the one called the Chopper Challenge. It was on on the Country Channel. Didn't they do that like where they would fly them out, give them a toolbox, and you had to build a bike in a certain? We uh, had yeah, we had uh, twenty five days to build. It. They say thirty on the thing, but it was twenty five days. I think Garley did that. Adam Garley. Okay. Out yeah. of Dallas. It was on the Country Channel. It was called the the yeah. Chopper Challenge. Yeah, and wasn't it like over there so in like SNS Malibu or something? Be like you, SNS gives everybody a motor. Yeah. Um, you can make your own frame. You can get Paco. Paco will give you a frame. I bought a Paco and modified it. Yeah. But like you'd have a list. So you don't have to spend too much money. But I didn't use anything on the list. It was all like the everyone's. It's like it's like if you're a chef and they're giving everybody the same recipe. Yeah. yeah. I mean the same ingredients. It's it's not the same to me. So I was I was you know I went. In the style of bikes that you've always built, have they always kind of been along this vintage chopper kind of vibe? You know what I'm saying? Even back whenever the billet chopper was the King Dingling. So Billet was hot at the yeah. time and it was hard to like to try to charge, you know, over twenty grand for a bike when people were getting, you know, thirty grand for like a ground pounder. Yeah. And yeah. then they see like this rusty thing and they're like, How what are you charging thirty grand for? And I'm like, You don't fucking know how much work? Yeah, like, exactly. This is like a third of the price of what I should be charging if we were like doing repair work at hundred and twenty an hour, a hundred bucks an hour. Like you can't count the hours. You know how many tanks it took to throw in the trash before this tank was the one? Yeah. Like yeah. I literally like would put holes in gas tanks and just throw them in the trash, like start a new one. Damn. But I wish I had all those tanks because all those tanks are fucking rare as fuck. <laughs> like all those old <laughs> peanut tanks that I was finding at the swap meet for five bucks and now fucking five hundred bucks on Instagram. It's crazy. But but uh, it it was a lot. It was it was a lot to charge for a bike like that mm-hmm. when it's leaking oil, you know. And you have these like beautiful billet machines. And Jesse was killing it with his bikes at the time when I was starting out. And uh, he inspired me a lot, I got to say. I used to go over there and, you know, I'm friends with Jesse and, you know, West Coast Choppers was like down the street at the time. I did cars, he did bikes. It was like a, we had a nice little Mm -hmm. thing going until I started building bikes. It seemed like, okay, now we're like kind of, I wouldn't say competition because there's no competition to Jesse, you know, but like kind of in the same world. So I feel like maybe he was being a little bit, but then one day he you know, prop me up on Instagram. He was like, yeah, you need to building cool bikes, different. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm glad he saw that it's different because I hated going to a shop knowing that he knows that I have a shop and I could be copying everything in there. And I ne- never knew the feeling until I opened a shop yeah. and let people go in there. It became a whorehouse. It was like, <laughs> everyone just comes in here, even customers. Yeah. Like, they're like, what would you do? I'm like, if I had your bike, I would do seat, pipe, da 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 I'm like, oh, cool. And then they go to the next shop and they're like, hey, I want to do this, yeah. this, and that. But they get it for a cheaper price. And they'll bring photos of my shit. Hey, can you build this for me? And it, it pissed me off because yeah. I'm like, I just wasted two hours talking to you, yeah. telling you how I would make your bike cooler. And then you go and try to save a buck and go take it somewhere else. So I'm like, now I know what Jesse felt like. Oh, yeah. Because he would imagine. stop work. You know, imagine like his place was a hot, like, stop for the yeah. whole world there's always lines of people trying to come in and buy t-shirts and same th- kind of thing happened here on melrose and it's like at the end of the day like what are we doing this for like we're we're just letting everybody see our shit yeah but i don't want to be arrogant either i don't want to be like oh you can't come in you have a shop or like you can't come in you're just 
Yeah, you're not yeah. spending money, so you have to treat everyone equal. And some guy that you know didn't have like a nice, like he didn't look like he had money or whatever. That's the guy that would surprise you and be like, "Hey, I want to get a bike. I got 50 G's. Can you start building me yeah. a bike?" Yeah. So you can't really judge anyone like when they walk in. You just have to be like, you know, humble and you know expect everyone to you know even if they buy a T-shirt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I understand why us bike builders need to sell merch. Mm. There's no money in the bike. By the end of the day, when you're done, you've exposed all everything you've done, all your secrets, all your fucking yeah, whatever it took you. Some people five, some people twenty five years to get there, mm -hmm. and just expose it to the world for nothing. It's just like no. well, I think now, I mean, it's probably catapulted like people's growth time because, like you said, growing up in a around Gene Winfield and in that world of like all this uh, stuff that they have YouTube channels for now or. That they post all the all the the work they're doing on Instagram, and then everybody's like, "Hey, how'd you do that?" And some people take the time to, "Oh, I did this and this and this." But I mean, when I first started custom painting, there was like you could get a DVD with a tutorial on how to do gold leaf or some shit like that, right? But there was always like one little thing missing that was the it was the keystone to the fucking arch to be able to complete it, right? You mean that it was missing cuz they was missing something. They purposely I, yeah. they took it out so you, And I feel like they would pull it out because and, and yes. I as as a I feel the same. I would always when people would ask me like, "Hey, how do I do this?" You know, if someone was asked a broad question like, "Hey man, how how do I do gold leaf?" and I'm like I can't answer that, but I can answer a question once I know that you've tried. Cuz once you've tried, then you're going to come to a roadblock and I'm going to know exactly where that road... The phone call is where the learning begins. Yeah, yeah. Because once you get to the roadblock, that means that you've already... You've now invested time, like some of your own time and energy and money into learning this process or craft. And so I respect that more. And I'm more willing to answer that question like than that. the broad question of how do I do this? Tell me from start to scratch. No, you're... Because I always tell dudes... You nailed it, dude. You nailed it because it's also those nights you can't sleep trying to figure something out. Mm -hmm. The minute you find out, you're just forever just discovered something that's yeah yeah you know and you might even take that advice if someone called you and take another guy's advice and come up with your own shit that yeah. you never even thought of and that's kind of what happened to me too and the roadblock man that's a key thing is um that's a trial and error right yeah that's, trial that's error. the real learning curves yeah and i mean yeah. back in the day we didn't have instagram and the connection of painters that we do now so we are like painters across america are pretty open with each other like oh man i did this this way i did that that way but it's easy to tell who's on what levels right like you know some of the other painters that, that are in my kind of uh skill level like we share secrets all the time with each other because we all have different styles and adding a little bit of that flavor to mine doesn't make it look like his it just adds another tool to my toolbox and i might know how to do this and tell him and same thing so we all have the ability to kind of blend our shit together but the other thing, the other the caveat to it, or the uh, the playing devil's advocate, is the game is to be sold, not told. You know what I'm saying? So like, there's part of me where if somebody's making money selling DVDs, and I need help paying my rent this month, and I have knowledge that's worth something to somebody, like I would rather figure out a way to like, hey, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll run you through this bitch for a hundred bucks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Make something out of the damn damn, damn thing, you know? But yeah, man. So the with the paint too, man. I. I I've had my different stages of what I do and yeah there was a moment where I was just into painting and gold leafing and yeah and it, it's 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 crazy because it's one of those me like you need to know all medias to be to build a bike you yeah. need to know all of it mm -hmm. and some things I never cared about until I got into FXRs and it was the performance part mm -hmm. I always sent my engines out yeah you know yeah I worked on them you know took heads off did some random but yeah. like I didn't hone my own cylinders, I didn't do any bottom ends. I was send it all out. Mm -hmm. But when I started getting into FXRs, I mean, there's so much you can do on the outside of an FXR, but there's so much more you can do on performance and suspension. That's like almost like it's a new skill. Yeah. So yeah. it's not even like building bikes anymore. Mm -hmm. Now it's performance, it's building engines. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I just I feel like way more knowledgeable now. Yeah. I feel like you know I. When something breaks down, I'm like more into like, yeah. let's figure out why. Yeah. Well, before I was like, fuck. Yeah. Call the engine dudes. Call my machine shops. Well, as you, like, you know, you've been doing this for quite a while now. So you kind of, I think you probably hit certain parts where you feel confident in the skills that you've learned here. 
And so now you want another challenge and it is, okay, now I want to learn uh, internals on motors. I want to know, I want to know how this works. I want to be able to take it apart. I want to be able to make it better. And so as you like progress in your career and your skill sets, you kind of get to these plateaus or these steps on the ladder, if you will, where you can kind of devote a little bit more attention to this new craft, this new skill to hone because you've already kind of got this one to a comfortable space. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Um, I, I know what you mean. Like I said, I, I, I'm never, I'm not a welder. Like, can I glue two pieces of metal together with the, the little button thingy? Yeah. <laughs> but not nowhere near like what you can or TPJ. Did, they, or, did you have an inspector x-ray no, your welds before? No, uh-uh. You know? And so I yeah. get it. Cause that's who I was to tell I got into that school and, and, everything was just like we had yeah. inspectors check everything so i have some of that mili- military type shit behind me when i yeah. worked in the aircraft world i'd never want to go back to that i never want to go back to painting yeah yeah you know i would do one if like if it was a big deal bike and it was like hey we want to see you paint it i, I might do it because yeah, i know how yeah. to do it i painted cars and bikes uh, i still love to do lettering and some of yeah, that yeah yeah so flames stuff, and stuff yeah. like that i do love to do but like spraying and it, it's almost like if i had a spray booth yeah with if you all were, my paint supplies and my guns and the cleaners it's it's a little bit more easier to kind of jump into it as engraving is why i fell into where it's like close to what i do because engraving you almost have to be a, a machinist because of like you're making all your bits to engrave with mm-hmm. sharpening bits and different angles and you doing the old school hammer one i'm no, i'm doing it with the with the, oh with the with the, the handheld uh it's like a it's like a power hammer it's yeah got a yeah piston in it yeah so i'm using that but I am about to take a class and learn some of that. Oh, the old that, one too, the old dude. That even that one is is nice. I, I feel like the ones that are using like the Dremel these days. I don't really know if that's. Oh no, no, that's, that's how you thought it was always done with. Yeah. And I'm like, why is it like I I did the Dremel thing. It's kind of self taught. Yeah, then, I just then I studied like real engraving, like. Yeah, the way when you get those cuts, those the using that B, the I B guess. Graver. It's called dude, the B graver. Different ones, different angles, different, different ways they do different it. Different degrees, so yeah. you get. The light, it's all about how the light reflects. So mm-hmm. we do a deep one, it gets real dark because the light, but if you do them wide, you get maybe the light only on one. Oh, so is... you have to continue strokes and you can't dig, like your hand has to be on the mm-hmm. same, if you tilt, it goes deeper into the metal, so you have to stay the same stay height. The same. And once you fuck up, this is fucking up. Like when you paint, you fuck up, you can go back and touch it. With engraving, you gotta, you go deeper on one side, you gotta go back and do everything again, deeper. that same depth. Yeah, and try not to fuck up. That's so it's, it's it's tricky it, it's tricky but I, f- I find that like i'm working with the same kind of sharpening mm-hmm. and yeah it's kind of like machining it's like metal removing oh yeah, versus yeah. painting you got to kind of and i used to do leather work too you have to clean your whole area out it doesn't happen all the time so you don't do it every day and then when you do do it it's a drag and then uh one thing about that is you're not as good as you can be mm-hmm. like i'm not a good painter because i don't do it every day yeah. i know all the skeleton of painting i know the whole yeah. you know the the block sanding the guide coats like i, I learned yeah the process how to do a car and when i see guys now doing cars and they don't block it or they don't do guide coats mm-hmm. like i got to explain my painter is doing my car what a guide coat was damn and he ain't that young but yeah. he's younger than me but he ain't that young to just maybe just laziness like, wait how do you even know where your low spots are yeah he didn't even know what that was he goes it's a good trick I was like, that was like Mr. Miyagi slapping you upside your head right now, telling yeah. you. Like, it's like crazy to me. Like that. Yeah, like, but guide coats are they use that on just about anything where it comes to when it comes to uh, finishing out services and to get the highs and lows out. So, yeah, that's that's no, strange. They're just sanding away. Yeah. They got these like air tool block sanders that kind yeah. of bend, and they just. But can you imagine spend? extra 15 minutes and guide code it and now you know like, yeah that way you don't over sand certain areas you get those waves out and then you know it's just that type of shit that i'm like i, I don't know who's teaching anybody anything anymore yeah. but like, People, I, I used to go with books that's yeah. kind of where i learned how to pinstripe mm-hmm. like uh not von dutch but uh big daddy roth had these little yeah. booklets those shitty little printed i wish i still had them but like just i learned so much just about how he keeps his brushes in oil and how he cleans his brushes mm-hmm. and how you know because okay you're you're a good painter, but like, there's all these little tricks yeah. too. You know, all the little tricks. Striping is my my least good thing that I can do, right? So I I I, I can airbrush your face, realism, all that stuff. You do that, huh? Mm-hmm. Um, graphics, air, like I do everything on my bike. Everything is done by me. Um, 
you painted that thing right? yeah and then like the helmets we do a lot of helmets we do portraits on them and things like that but striping like i can outline graphics uh but you know like hey throw a throw a sick design uh, you, you know what i mean right here i can do it can i do it the way like you know a striper can where they just look at it throw a center line down and just whip it back and forth no i'm I'll do one Yours side. Yours will be all drawn out for days. And yeah. Per- yeah. And and that's like, man, how I am. I, you know, I'm too critical. It's so like, oh, this is too... It, I need to space it more so it's, you know, it's more pleasing to the eye. The good news is I don't see a lot of it anymore. I, I, like, it kind of, like, got played out to me. All the, You're talking about all the... All yeah, the design. Yeah, yeah. Shit, yeah. All the hood stuff that they... It was heavy in the, in the 2000s. Big. And I wanted to be that dude to be able to do that, too. Just to be able to throw shit down and I practice and practice and practice. And it's never enough. But, like, that shit is... is yeah. You have to do tons of it to get good. My my biggest back shit that I'm not good at is this perfectly straight line. Oh, yeah, yeah. On the gas tank or on a car. There's that, tricks to that. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not speaking from a, a place with of the tape lines and the pink. The, the yeah, the tape lines, and if you just even if you put a tape line, you can almost just see the the weight between the line and the pinstripe line, and try to keep that as consistent. It'll help you. That's because I think our eyes. I, I don't know. My eyes like really good with that yeah. uneven as shit. Uh huh. Like people always like look at my butt. I'm like, oh, shit's crooked, man. <laughs> right away. Yeah. They don't see it. I'll have three people that I'm the only one that sees it. Yeah. But like it's being able we're to. Gifted. <laughs> Being able to stripe though, like a, you know, I grew up on House of Color, so I, I the striping we use is more base coat that goes under the clear. Yeah. Versus a lot of traditional stripers will use one shot, and I just never grew up with that. So I know how to use some of it. I know the process, but it's just so foreign to me. But that's one of those things where I can go out with a little bitty, you know, toolbox, go to a bike show and stripe helmets all day, and come home with five or six hundred bucks versus. You know the way I do it now. I got to sand the helmet down, tape it off, draw the design, stripe it, then clear coat it, then sand it, buff it. You know what I mean? Then put it all back together and give it to you. And so at that point, it's like it's it's so much more materials involved. There's so much more yeah. time. And then you know what could have been just a hundred fifty dollars stripe design is now a six hundred dollar design with the clear coating and all that shit on the. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I get so, it. I, I love, it's like a tattoo I artist. I love the guys with the suitcase. I have a guy like that who'll show yeah, up. Yeah. And, uh, he just in my truck. He just showed up. But the lettering stuff is what's badass too. I mean, um, lettering's cool, dude. It, it just that's a whole nother fucking like deep dive of of t- uh, typography and different types of lettering and taking this letter and adding flavor to it to this type of font to it add flavor, up, dude. Too, it's so when you travel and stuff, especially mm. when you travel and you see like stores and signs. Yeah, and yeah. Especially older like. Building. When they used to, when let sign painting was more. You see like a cool S or a cool you know yeah. letter, and you're like. Fuck, just like just I've, I've one actually, letter that's got a little flair to yeah. it, and then just like standard block letters, and one letter you do a little yeah. something to it changes everything on a helmet or something like that. I've always like if I found like if I'm somewhere and I see just a badass, like like you said, one letter, like just one letter can that could be the sickest S I've ever seen, and then I'll take a picture of that S, and then like when I want to draw something, like all right, how do I take this flavor and add it to the other letters I need in my logo? You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah, inspiration from all kinds of places. Yeah, man. here's my here's my trick for when I was a letter when I was into lettering right here. This this right here, this twenty dollar bill mm-hmm. has so many cool fonts, fonts, drop shadows, the best numbers you've ever seen are money. Look at these; these are perfectly <laughs> racing numbers on helmets. Yeah. And obviously, there's a ten, there's a dollar, there's a five dollar bill. But if you have them all, and they have different fonts, even some of the stuff that's scripted, if you need like. It, it's got so much cool shit on it. Even look at this. Yeah. This is a good tool to have when you're doing lettering. A $20 bill or any kind of bill. <laughs> it's all there. It works. So when you started getting into the, uh, you know, like the Dynas and FXRs and stuff, like you like you said earlier, the, the goal was to narrow it, like find the bulky areas and thin it up and slim it down. Like I feel like, you know, early on you were doing knee cuts in these tanks quite quite a while ago but also you you took it to another level instead of just like like shaving it out you you bring we we're just doing flavor. that yesterday. we're looking at a lot of people are doing the knee cuts and i'm like man like they're not like ours yeah yeah there's a lot more intricacy into the knee cut it's got a lot of bul- it's got a bulbous area so that we actually when we english wheel the parts it mm. bulbed out that's the center where they tuck in and then the insides people think i just Dished. cut them and swap switch yeah. them over but they're handmade yeah so it's a little bit more work mm-hmm. 
but it's got a lot more flair and like it's more chiseled versus just yeah. like you just put a flat plate and bent it out like I don't, I don't yeah know. it looks some it, out there you know and i mean it it kind of for me with graphics when people do the knee cutouts it kind of fucks up the flow but sometimes when you have a more intricate design like some of the tanks that you've done it gives it to where you can design the paint job off that that face of the tank yes and carry it around but i don't think it's that intricate okay. i think I, I keep it because of the like like that tank like i did knee bends on that that bike's not here today but like oh yeah that yeah. bike i did a weird one that was a really hard one but it's i i actually popped the outsides out i had to like yeah roll them out and give them more you know bulbous shape yeah um but when I do them, it's so that I don't have to put paint on them. I don't have to go crazy with the paint. Yeah. Like that bike's a good example. I did my, my FXR you saw earlier is kind of based off of that, where you're looking, the lines of the, the metal work is the paint job. Mm -hmm. So you could put a solid paint over it. Yeah. I do little flourishes with some line work and some double pinstripes or maybe like a, you know, the three quarter inch lines I put. Yeah. But that's just to highlight the body work. To me, the minute I put a paint job on that bike or yeah. my, my FXR with the dish tanks, if I put a fancy paint job, it's gone. You don't yeah, see it. You don't see it. it. Yeah. I mean, I have proof to show it. I remember like People uh, walk by the bike and don't even know it. Yeah. Funny, I mean, I've said it a million times on this podcast, but whenever I worked for under Rick Fairless in the biker build-off days and uh, for his painter, by the way, and uh, I remember him talking with Matt Hotch whenever they was doing it. And Matt, because Rick Fairless' shit's airbrushed toe-to-toe, and Matt Hotz, even on the show, says, I don't want to hide all this metal work I just did on this bike with with the paint. Like, I want the paint to extenuate, like, what I did with metal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I've always thought about that. I mean, it's a stab in the heart for a painter. But at the same time, it's it's also like the it's the battle of of art artistry on the canvas. You know what I'm saying? I, I look at it as straight ego. I'm yeah. like, wait, I put 500 hours into this shit. And it's going to be painted. And it's most likely going to be painted black or a dark color because that's yeah. what I'm into. <laughs> and we already had, like, plenty of those. And they just think it's the same bike as last time. And that's a, a lot why I do this, like, metal mm -hmm. nickel finish on these bikes is ego. <laughs> it's because I don't want to hide all the work. Yeah, yeah. And there's tons of it. I wish that bike was here. It's at our, our friend's. That's uh, a painting's bad. Which, which artist painted that one? Sunny Boy. Oh, he painted that one? Yeah. Fuck. I mean, it's all no, bare I mean, metal. Like the, the paint, huh? Like the 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 painting. It's just highlights. Oh, oh, the painting of yeah, the painting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It's uh, Yule. Isn't oh, it? yeah, yeah. David Yule. David Yule. Yeah, he's out of Boulder area. I just I just ran into him. I was in Daytona. Like, were you there? Like, uh, Daytona Beach? My first time, and he was there painting some girl. <laughs> but yeah, he he made that. No, I'm trying but to. The I'm, painting on the bike was Sunny Boy. It was really yeah. not nothing really painted. It's just yeah. a couple panels. Just to give it some contrast, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's uh, that that metal work is kind of like it's same with cars. I, all my my I used to do chop tops and all yeah, that, yeah. and all you're doing is like putting paint and covering it. So and and the body lines are beautiful body lines in mm -hmm. the 30s and 40s and 50s. So I would do primer or base yeah. coat. So that was my trick on cars. Like you, that body line is gone the minute there's like a gloss paint job. On yeah, it, in my that opinion. Makes sense. No, I agree. I agree. It's a uh, that's. I mean, that's what's. Uh, that's what I, I think makes like some of your bikes more art based, if you will, because you are going against some of the traditional things that everybody else is going to do on their bikes. You know, put clear on it, paint it in a certain way, paint the whole thing, do this. You know, I guess when you touch every aspect of the bike, you you also can find a way to highlight every aspect of the bike with the right finishes and the right coatings, if you will, to yeah. kind of like make it look how you want it to look yeah and i don't saying? have any of that in mind when i build a bike i don't even know what it's going to look like yeah i don't draw my bikes i don't know what i i really until today with the technology i see people doing shit with their ipads yeah like i can make my life way easier even with the layout when i do engraving yeah like all the engravers i learned are doing it on their ipad mm -hmm. i'm like erase draw it erase <laughs> draw it um same with same with the bike like imagine Fender, sissy bar, you have to see it. I yeah. at least bend something, like some kind of wire. I have to physically see it. Yeah, yeah. And it's a lot of wasted metal at the end, but I can't just draw it and say I'm going to like it. I have to I have to see it from this angle. I have to get above it. I have to go. Yeah. When the bike's on a lift, and then when the bike's done and it's on the ground, two different bikes. Yeah, for sure. So I like to build on the ground, 
get the shape and then raise it up or you don't fuck your back up and actually yeah, you already know what your you're you're building your it from be. i think that you probably take the same approach that i do with paint like i i feel like uh I have to see this from a viewing distance. How are people? How is the person that's gonna, gonna see this? Yeah. And if all the paint lines work that way, like yeah, it's, I can put all the body work on the lift, but up in the air, it's like okay, I'm looking at it eye level. It's like you never see a bike eye level ever. In some bikes, you, you like the kickstand part fucks me up. So yeah. I'm like you know, you're gonna have this thing parked and it's gonna lean to the left side. You're not gonna see all this. So then like some of these bikes, I'll make center stands for them because. Mm -hmm. How they're gonna be shown is, is yeah. It's a it's a asymmetrical yeah piece exactly. And the kickstand fucks you up. <laughs> and they take never the turn the wheel. You know, like everybody yeah. like turn the wheel to the left. Like no, my wheel stays straight. Yeah. The bike does not look the same when the wheels turn to the left in a photo. Mm, I agree. As when you see like that fucker is how it's supposed to be looking like it's going fast mm -hmm. next to you on the freeway. That's how you see the bike. And so it's got to look like it's going 100 miles an hour when it's parked. Yeah. And that's not going to happen with the wheel turned or with the bike leaning on the kickstand. Mm. It just doesn't look fast. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Like I said, it's it's your art, and it's almost like the the gallery is going to be the bike show or the oh, the sure. place. Some so painters you, are like, I don't want it on this wall next to this door. It needs yeah. to be right in the middle of the wall, and the background should be gray and not white. And exactly. It's like I'm sure there's prima donna painters out there. And oh, I mean, you can yeah. say that about me, but I mean, what are we building here? Are we building a bike that's going to be one of a kind that's going to blow minds, or are we just building a bike to ride? Well, if we are going to blow minds. Yeah. Take the time, make a bike stand. And another thing about traveling is when you fucking go to Japan, those guys spend more time on the display of the bike than the actual bike. For real. When you go to Moon Eyes and you're like, like, I don't know if you've seen any of these photos, but like, let's just take a chopper from a company, small company in Tokyo, build a bike, and they, build, they bring the bike out there. And they want hardwood floor under the bike. Mm -hmm. like, so they would build a hardwood floor that is built around the bike and then the bike would come or one guy brought leaves these like japanese cherry leaves that are famous once a year they they fall or you see them all over tokyo whatever yeah. they brought all that and they put it around the bike and some of the stands and it it's like i get it man it's it's this is a show and yeah you, you know some people have been doing it here too. I see a lot of it, well, especially it, in the '60s. They were doing a lot of that. I mean, it's always been heavy in the lowrider world. Like, go to lowrider show. There's, right. you know, there's mirrors under everything. There's that. There's what whole... I just said is kind of like, I'm trying to remember some of this stuff, but it's so mind blowing. Yeah. How the, the stands and displays are that it, it's hard to even remember. But like, I, I just get blown away by that stuff when I go there. Mm. The signages that they would do. Hand painted signs or airbrushed. Like, or... Yeah, with like lit up with you know different things and. It, it's all part of it. Yeah. So you have to kind of, you know, to me, it's like, it's just parts of a, of, of a final project. It's not, it, you're not done just by having an idea for a bike. It's yeah, until yeah. it's done and sitting there in the room and the, you see the reaction on people and mm -hmm. it's important when people spend like 10 minutes on the bike and you're like, whoa, there's the guy's still staring at the bike. He's like going on every angle. He's seeing it. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's, it's, we didn't waste our time. Yeah. We didn't just, you know, because these days people are not impressed, you know, like they used to be. Well, I mean, to take a jab at even like my bike and the bikes that I'm kind of in the world of, <clears throat> you know, performance baggers, there's only a, there's only now starting to be some people really doing one-off parts on these things. It's just now starting to transcend bolt-on, if you will, Yeah. to one of my good friends is bringing his bike up. That he, he goes by My Machinist. And he machined like his own swing arm. I mean, he has a CNC. He's a CNC is by, or a machinist by trade, I guess is what they call him. Yeah. Um, and he just made all his parts for it. And I think that we're going to start seeing more of that. But I guess, I mean, I'm not, I'm a painter. So it's like, the, I don't really understand that as much. But I guess making all these things by hand versus making my machine is probably going to also have two different type of worlds of, of craftsmanship, but still the same end result, if you will. Yeah. Um, but even like some of the parts that you've made for your for the FXRs and stuff, like I always love the brake pedal. It's simple, it's clean, it looks like it could be factory. But when everybody's doing these wireframe kind of billet pieces, like you got this cast looking piece. I don't know if it's cast, it is cast. but this cast piece that just kind of it's got it took swag. Me four years to make that piece. <laughs> it, it, casting moves, and you know you got the cone right there, yeah. and it wasn't hard. It wasn't easy to get it to to work, but it had to be a cast because mm -hmm. the original one's casted and I didn't make it for 
anything but i can't find those fucking things when yeah. i need them and when i do they're usually you know <laughs> scraped so yeah. then i will i would machine them and put a peg and machine a thread and put a yeah, little toe put a peg, peg on, on the end so i'm like well i'm gonna make that and i didn't think it was gonna it was gonna be like a couple sold here and there that's what i thought and yeah they're fucking selling people yeah they it's a people different change look. them when they have a stock one which to me i was like there was just supposed to you know because you can call v-twin and get most of those parts mm -hmm. but you can't get the arm mm. you know and so that's one thing that's obsolete is that arm so I'm yeah like, okay well and they're 150 bucks <laughs> at least it's like finding a, a break arm for a knucklehead when you find one or used to be when you find them at an fxr part especially anything with the floorboards or any of those you know those real rare yeah years that they made some floorboards for or like some of the peas convertible bags and yeah, it's wild. It's like finding gold. It's like, fuck. <laughs> or louvered side covers. It's the same the thing feeling now. as like when, when I find a knucklehead part. Yeah. That yeah. swap me. It's, it's good. It feels good. It's crazy how the FXR scene has gone through with these waves of what's most popular. Like whether it's like louvered side covers had a thing for a while where everybody and their mom was, you know, selling those things. You have like, no idea. It's like Bitcoin was high. I went and tried to source out the louver punches to yeah. make one. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, each one is different size. For real? Yeah, I thought it was two. Like, let's call it three inch two two inch and then two one inch so it's three dies i'm like three dies cost like each each die is like eight to a thousand bucks without the machine Damn. so i'm like i'm gonna have to buy three dies to make a fucking louver then i go and measure it and it's like there's a i think there's six and each one is a different louver size so it took some work whoever made those <laughs> I, I studied i was gonna make them only because i had to spend 400 bucks on a set when i needed them <laughs> They're bitching though. It's cool. Yeah, they do look good on there. I they do. Got I do have to admit that I get really happy when I see them. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, it's when awesome. I see one for sale, I'm like, yeah. So you've all have you? I, I want to say you built bikes for some like celebrities and things like that. Is that? Yeah, I built some B or a, Ace Ace celebrities. I guess some of those guys. <laughs> but I also remember watching the uh, the Norman Reedus thing when he came out and he rode one of your FXRs. Or was that his? Or I know that you built it. Yeah, uh, I don't know which one he rode on the show anymore, but he ended up buying a couple of my bikes. For real? Nice. Like, I built him one. Well, he's got three or four of my bikes. Um, but he he came, like, he moved, like, so he was in a, where they were filming The Walking Dead, and so he needed the bikes there. Mm -hmm. And then he was like, oh, I'm coming out to LA a lot again. So then I'm like, well, here, don't ship your bike. I'll just ride mine. Yeah. And he came back from a ride. He's like, oh, I need this one too. <laughs> so then he bought my personal bike. Um, so now he's got a few of them. Nice. That got, that's got to feel good to have a bike like that, you know. Like I said, for someone like me from Texas, like we're so far removed from any of that kind of culture, of movie culture, or TV culture. So you are, but you're not, because a lot of it, a lot of it is Texas. <laughs> for real, it's weird. Oh shit! I mean, I feel like everybody wants to be Texas out here. I mean, well, I mean, the chopper scene seems to be going through a wave of now they want to be cowboys. I mean. <laughs> I think I think they go hand in hand, cowboys and bikers. Yeah, yeah. Well, just they, you know? they started dressing differently. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's one hundred percent true. But also, I mean, look, they're doing born free in Texas. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. That's not too far from where we live too, so we're pretty. I think now, I think now everybody can claim their shit. You know. Yeah, yeah. You know, before you're like, no one really knew it. No one knew what a Frisco bike was. I mean, they say it loosely, but like. Yeah. You yeah. know, but you go to Texas, yeah. You guys have your own style. You go to the East Coast, mm -hmm. New York, whatever, like they have yeah. their style. Now it's all fucking convoluted with everything. Yeah. But yeah. I think now it's time to claim everything, you know? Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I, I think. Yeah. yeah. SoCal. Well, we got plenty of them. We know cocktail shakers and fucking Flanders, <laughs> Ape Hanger, like all that shit. Yeah. I love those bikes, but I, I couldn't, after seeing five of them, say different colors, it's like. Yeah. That's why but, I kind of trip out on like how. We do shows in America mm -hmm. when I think a lot of those bikes that are being judged should be in different classes. I don't see, sense. I'm not going to say any names, but I'm not, I can't see Joe Schmo's bike next to this guy's bike mm -hmm. being and even running up for the same award. Yeah. It's too, like, you can't compare, you know, a re old piece that someone re to someone that made their own. Yeah. It should be a different class. Yeah. I I feel you know? like for sure, and I, I've never got to experience overseas shows, but just from people that I've talked to yourself, many others, um, we just don't have any real shows here. We don't have any real prestigious shows. It's worth building a. They're events. They're, they're events, not, you know. But I would there's, say they're just like you know, 
but so but there's no technical about like it's not like you're going to get the riddler award for something some amazing craftsmanship there's not a show with that kind of uh i don't know if it's a purse or just like a notoriety at the end of it for building such a you know amazing bike or whatnot you know what i'm saying it's like they used to have some things i believe i mean i guess biker build-off was one of those ones that it was cool to win a biker build-off show um i maybe easy rider shows had a little bit of a thing for a while but then there was like you would do a couple shows and then you could get to a chance to go compete with another place like italy or something like that i don't know there's just not a well the winning to me was that you have a documentation of this build like you know what was done yeah when you go to born free or some of these shows it's like here's all the bikes on the lawn yeah like when you go to japan when i go to indonesia you bring your bike up on the stage if you're Mm -hmm. in the builders circle you build bring your bike and you talk about it in front of fifty thousand people fuck they give you the microphone tell tell us about your bike what did you do (laughs) damn that's got to be a so you so you walk out of there empty-handed with no trophy you got you got to say your piece you got to express what the bike meant to you i'm sure i'm Maybe I'm not seen. Maybe I'm not on YouTube. Maybe there are a lot of it. But it. when I get when I walk away from them, I'm like, "Cool bike." I hope people got to see all that. Yeah. I hope people understood. Like, there's shit under my bikes. You look under the frame. Mm-hmm. There's engraved parts. Like, I like to hide shit in places. It's more for me to know. It's more, like I do it so when I'm dead, someone's gonna be like working on this bike. Like, motherfucker, put this thing up. Like, you know, like, because we saw those survivors. I've worked on old bikes yeah. that like guys aren't around anymore. And I'm like, that's the coolest shit ever. <laughs> Even though it was corny, he did it, mm-hmm. and and no one knew it was there until you have the bike on your lift or until you took something off of it. Yeah. And, like, that's why I love engraving on bikes. Mm-hmm. It's like a time and place. It's like a stamp of, like, of period. Yeah. You know? And and I'm like, I got to learn how to do that. And I thought it was, like, dremeling. I thought it was, like, yeah, well, yeah. whatever it is. Because at the end of the day, it's like taking a knife and carving your name on a picnic table at the, the park. Mm-hmm. It's like it'll be there one day when you're dead. And and that's kind of like no, that's I mean, a good concept, man. Like you're you're making a mark in the metal. And that's brings up the other subject I want to tell you. Like you're saying, like you can tell, like some of my bikes when you see them is because if you don't do that to yourself, what are you really doing? Yeah. You know, if you're gonna be just a mediocre builder, um, it's it's like Xerox copies, man. It's the same thing over and over. Yeah. So to me, if one piece or a hundred pieces on the bike have to be completely like thought of and like something special meaningful mm-hmm. behind it like otherwise it's like you're wasting your time and it's well like, that's what why well, i, I, I guess i can to, sorry to cut you off but yeah. you should be able to see it like from a mile away you should be like yeah I know, like i know that's a harley i know that's an indian right should be the same mm-hmm. i know that's a billy lane i know that's a jesse james yeah what what you've done in my opinion is what i try to uh, like tell other builders or other people that are trying to get into building that are building more modern bikes that you can find a way to build things for this like you I, I can look at one of your fxrs and say that's a built bike not an assembled bike not a not a catalog bike you know what i'm saying yeah and some people uh, you know not not taking a dig at it but some people have a hard time doing that because there is 40 different options for for brake pedals now there is 40 different op- options for risers but those that want to be in my opinion a builder they have to look at this bike no matter how new or old it is and say what do i know how to do to make this thing different and you know i i feel like i don't know you've done such a good job at taking something more modern like an fxr com- compared it to the chopper scene right where you, you your frames and just so much different shit you can do and uh you truly made a bike where it's it's got a flavor you have a you've created your own style of fxr in my opinion if that makes sense thank you i appreciate so, that i mean i just, i don't want to reinvent the fxr i just want to do something that's like not too over the top, but yeah. also it's going to stand out opposed to a lot of them because yeah. man, there's not much you can really do. And there's some FXRs come through my shop, and I'm like, this one is just too clean to the, to yeah. fuck with to yeah. begin with. And then you start appreciating them because you know they're not coming back. Mm-hmm. So there's it's the same with knuckleheads too. Like you would yeah. take a knucklehead frame and cut the tabs off the frame is kind of sacrilegious. <laughs> I'm like, I don't give a fuck. Like. This is where we're going with it, and that's if that bracket has to be removed, it's got to be removed. Yeah, yeah. And if it's never going back to a restoration job, then so be it. Mm-hmm. But it's ballsy, and you have to do it sometimes, and that's kind of like with the FXR. 
Yeah. I try not to cut up a perfectly good gas tank. Believe me, if I cut those tanks up, most likely some of them had either rust or a dent already and then ruined the yeah, perfect yeah. paint job. Like, a guy wants me to cut a tank right now. I'm like, can I just keep yours and I'll find you another shitty one to cut up because, yeah, you know, I, know I have it cut in two pieces. So I could take out any dent out of it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you it, it it's different now than it was even five years ago with FXRs. They're just... You can't buy them like you could before. Like yeah, those virgins I'm, are like expensive now. Uh, the the FXR prices have just gone so up and down, left and right. It's hard to tell where it's gonna land. But I mean, all bikes right now are but going pretty high. If Nick was here, he'd tell us exactly how many they made. It'd probably make us feel a little bit more fucked up about it. But <laughs> but they. Oh yeah, it's just only fifteen hundred of those ever. Uh, yeah. yeah. So no, I know what you mean. I, I dig it, man. I, I've I've always uh, you know, to what I was saying earlier, it's like when you have a you know there's certain people that have styles of fxrs that they put out and you know i could see someone building or doing their own little custom to an fxr and going yeah i'm kind of going for a power plant style on this one you know and that's kind of what i mean by that like it's got like its own flavor and you know you could say like one of my favorite bikes is that that fxr that's like they chop the neck and it has that frisco on the side of the gas tank and it's like that it's a real famous picture of it just sitting on top of the I don't know where it's at. It might even been in L.A., but it's it just has... It's an H.A. bike or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. Fuck. I love the picture. I love the whole thing. But that bike in general, or Al Emerson with the one he's been building for one of these guys, uh, Soldier's Fortune, I believe, or something like that. Just, I, I like when they cut them up and chop them and make them like D-rate choppers and shit like that, but I also like what you're doing. And, you know, I've always been a big fan of FXR Division. My, my first FXR I built was raked. I raked it. I, I didn't know any better, but I, it's still there. I'll show it to you when we get back. But it's a mild rake, but I just wanted to. Kinda, Something different. I didn't realize, you know, it was going performance. I thought we were doing like FXRs to me, it was like Marlboro Man style, you know? Oh, like, uh, yeah. That kind of like. <laughs> and, and now I see, like, if you, you know what a tough guy chopper is? Yeah. It's very much like an FXR. Mm. And it comes from the same breed, the same type of person. Yeah, 100%. You know? Mag wheels, dual discs, like pr- like speaks performance. Like you see upgraded brakes. It's it's a tough guy bike, and especially with the bar setup with the mid controls, it's just like mm-hmm. that's really how you sit on it when you're fucking flip, flipping through lanes, and that's what it comes down to. Like that's why I can't really roll around with big fairings and bags. I mean, I yeah. build a lot of them for people, but for me, it's the stripped down version is the best version. Well, here, I no mean, mirrors. hanging out, riding around here, uh, yeah, I wish, because I have a T-Sport, I wish I was on that right now. Yeah, yeah, um, you do. <laughs> because you're trying to get that bike between some of these, these uh, getting up to the lights. But um, at the same time, as soon as we get outside of the city, though, I'm going to be glad I'm on this bike. So mobbing back to Texas and keeping all the wind off me, I'm going to. Yeah, no, I do love the fairing for those long rides, <laughs> I got to say. But I love a T-Sport fairing, too. That's it's probably it's my favorite fairing honestly. it is mine too agreed yeah. it blocks enough wind keeps enough wind off your chest and even your helmet i'm a hoarder of them i have i have maybe eight of them right now but I've, I've just recently bought a bike from texas just for the fairing it was hammered. you could probably uh sell those and maybe put a down payment on the house for sure yeah so i don't know out here but definitely in texas <laughs> yeah they're, they're what, like two grand or something shit With more the, than that they're really? going for like three almost four now really mm-hmm. yeah. if they're oh. clean and you got the trees and all that shit my thing is like when I move to the new shop, I want just the wall of the the T-Sport hanging in. And I have in. all the colors too. I have all the factory colors. OEM. I have one T-Sport fairing in the box with all like the eyebrow is in the plastic with the Harley oh, with shit. The, all the OEM numbers and the little white bags. Uh-huh. Every little part for the gearbox, everything is in the package still. Damn. Yeah, those are unpainted. Uh, those are those are worth money, man. I mean, RT fairings are clearly worth money too. But when you think about it, like uh, you have an original RT fairing, it's all good, it's mint condition. You know, shipping those things is fucking so hard. You know, it's like, yeah, I need four grand for this fairing. Oh, and by the way, it's six hundred dollars to ship it. You know what I mean? And you As don't a, want to ship. Like, and you don't standard like standard shit. Exactly. Know? As opposed to like, if you have a little bit of money in these T Sport fairings, like it's a lot easier to ship them and get them to. I never thought about that. I, I have to ship one soon, a big one. Yeah. A guy shipped to me just a paint. He's like, I want your flare on this paint job. And I'm like, okay. And he sent the whole tins. Damn. And now it's painted. I'm just getting the clear coat done on it. And I'm like, shit, I got to send it back. <laughs> it's going to be an expensive set setup. Probably better to just drive it to the guy somewhere. Yeah, I mean, if he's within, you know, 500 miles, it's way no, worth the drive. Far. He's far. He's in Michigan. Oh, shit. Yeah, he's fucked. <laughs> 
I used to drive around. Uh, I mean, I back. I used to paint a lot of bikes in Northern California. And it got to a point where when I started this podcast in eighteen, I would just say, "Hey, man, I'll just come pick the shit up. I'll come and do a couple podcasts with some people around. Drop down to L.A., go home, paint the shit." And then I'm like, just give me what it would have costed to ship and gas. And back then, gas, you know, 500 bucks will get me to NorCal and back just about easily. But now it's like 500 bucks. I'm, I think on this trip right now, I'm going to be like $1,800 in gas on this motorcycle trip. Fuck. So it, six, think, seven dollars. Imagine again. if that was a car. Yeah, exactly. God, damn. It's it's pretty gnarly, man. But oh man, it's it's been a what's what's a what's gas in Texas cost right now? Uh, it's about. Four thirty, four fifty. Golly, that's yeah. a dream. I don't know. I hadn't been there in a month. We haven't been there in a while, but you know, when we left, well, it was, you know, it might not be because within this month it changed a lot. Yeah, for sure. We first started hitting high gas prices when we hit Nevada. It started getting into the sixes, and then we were kind of more worried when we were going up the coast that we were going to hit some of those big like eight, nine dollar things, like you'd see little yeah. pictures on Instagram here. And th- we never really got that. We hit a couple sevens. Uh, but even here, it's it's pretty mellow at like six something. But we're used to that. I mean, the entire Pacific Northwest was six something dollars. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. Well, the good news is you put it in, into your bike, so you get it back out. Yeah, you, you get know? the experience back out. <laughs> yeah. And the Shit, car kind of sucks. Other than like these other trips, I mean, what do you got? You got anything big planned this year? You got some builds that you're going to be coming out with, or? Um, I'm- Parts. Starting my Virginia City build right now. We have five, Just four now? weeks. Yeah, I started this week. I'm going to put something together. It's probably going to be all punk yeah. rock, bare metal. Just Hell yeah. You can see all the work we did, kind of. All right, so you, are you building the chopper or the FXR for this I, one? They put me in the chopper, in the FXR. Nice, section. nice. So I have to build an FXR. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. I have one one of three frames that's handmade for an FXR. It's up on my lift right now. Yeah. Um, I know I'm going to use that. I made some side covers out of aluminum. Um, I have this old H8 FXR rear fender that came off this dead dude's bike that I bought. <laughs> when I bought it, they like cut the death head off the tank and oh shit left it's just a cut out of bare metal on it. And I always thought this this is a good bike for special occasion. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm trying to find a belt drive for it right now because I do want to do an open belt. Yeah. But I don't think I'm going to finish this bike where it's like a show bike. It's probably going to be all bare metal, bare mm-hmm. metal frame. I'm probably just going to take it apart, scotch brite yeah. everything, and bring it out there. They're going to be mad at me. But I, I'm going through a, a, a crisis right now with the shop. They sold our building after 20 years, and mm-hmm. it all came at the same time. I said yes to all these things. So I overcommitted. And uh, I'm also building a bike for you and McGregor right now that Harley decided that they want to be a part of. So. Mm-hmm. Harley's documenting this build. That's dope. It's a 1969 XLCH. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you guys know Ewan, but he's yeah. a he's a big actor. Long way round, long yeah, way so down. Yeah, so he's doing one to, he's riding to Savannah, Georgia. Mm-hmm. And the motherfucker decides to ride a 69 Sportster to Savannah, Georgia. Is that Georgia. the one that was sitting in the... Uh, in... It's, it's it's not in there right oh, now. Oh, it's, it's not covered. there, okay. Um, it's a chopper, it's a survivor. We got it from Meekum Museum or Meekum Auction. Um, we took it all apart. I engraved a bunch of shit on it and... Couldn't mm-hmm. touch a lot of the patina on it, um, and I can't really show it to you guys yet. But yeah, it's fine because uh, Harley's kind of going to be the first to show it. They don't like me because I leak photos. Yeah. Oh, did you do the new bike? Did you leak it? Uh-huh. Oh yeah, I got it specific. Don't show this to anyone. But they were excited about it. Yeah. And I feel like you guys sent it to me because you want me to leak it and you don't want to say it. Is that what's going on? But I love that type of shit though. Yeah. I like when when uh, you know I don't know if you know Brad. Uh, Brad, he works for Harley. Uh, is is it? I don't think I don't really know anybody proper anymore. There, he's a buddy, but he's the guy. He's the main man. Yeah. He's like, hey, wait till you see this thing. He's like, you're gonna be very happy. I took your advice, and it was about the fairing. I was like, these fairings didn't come back. And he's yeah. like, yeah, we took your advice. I don't want to take any yeah yeah credit for it, but you know, I was whispering in their ears a lot back then. I was like, this is gonna be the next thing. Trust me. Yeah, I was sitting on the photo for about a year, year and a half, almost the the one that i leaked and uh they they never reached out to me once i leaked it they just kind of hit up all the people that knew me you know what i mean and said said hey man can you tell them to take that down by the time it got back to me everybody and their mom had already reposted there was already youtube videos about it so you're the one that posted because it was up uh two or three days earlier no it was up september oh that early yeah i'll show you it uh yeah and there was all these like so what ended up happening is when we leaked it. That's what it, you guys do, man. That's yeah. what you guys, you're supposed to 
I helped them. You know, they should have given me one. You, you got to stir it up a little bit and then make peace. You know, you got you got to get people's <laughs> feathers perky and then you tell them it's okay. Calm down. Yeah. So here we are. You know, September 29th on my oh birthday. Oh my god. And all these people in Harley are, are like dealerships. So what happened is a lot of people online started calling dealerships to ask about the bike. And so then the people at the dealerships have no fucking clue about this bike. No. So then they they kick it up to corporate and they're like, yo, what the fuck? What's this? And then so then I even have like people that worked at Harley, not proper, but like dealerships across America going, how do you know this is true? This isn't a real bike, blah, blah, blah. Where did you get this from? Blah, blah. You know what I mean? Like kind of Karen, like going full Karen on me. And she was like, look, I had the photo and I ain't on none of that NDA shit. So and I ain't snitching on who I got the photo from. So. You're welcome, because that thing had like That's four or five months. Type shit, yeah, that that thing had four or five months of like YouTube videos, like people going, "Man, if this is real, this is gonna be badass." And you had a lot of people going, "I hate it, I hate it." It just it made so much shit. <laughs> Good, it's it, almost there. It's almost oh. there. <laughs> a little too low. That's low. the best part. If they did, if they nailed it, then a, a lot of us would be out of business. You know? Yeah, for sure. They can't. You know, at the end of the they day, they left some room for improvement for us. Yeah, good, good for Harley, and good for them to do it in in this manner. They normally would come out with this two years from now when it's not cool anymore. Yeah, Rock they actually seat. nailed it on time. Yeah, it's it completely did for sure. Which I've had this discussion with Harley guys, mm -hmm. and I'm like, you guys are always about five years late. And he's mm -hmm. like, no, that's how long it takes to develop something. Like yeah. When they came out with all those like flat. Flat black, flat yeah. denim, all this shit. It was like, ooh, you guys are way late. Like, <laughs> we're we're on to flake now. Everybody wants, like, everybody wants, you know, new things now. What sucks is like everybody. Well, not nah, would say everybody. I wouldn't generalize that much, but it seems like Chrome is really making a resurgence right now. Bad and now, them. there's no. Where you get good Chrome at overseas. They're all gone. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of the places we used to use back in the 2000s that were out of here. I'm in glad California. you said that though about the Chrome mm -hmm. because I never spoke about it, but I just see it and I feel it. And I'm dealing with Chrome every time, and it's like I constantly have to send shit to get redone again. Mm -hmm. It's like the Chrome shops are being regulated so bad out here that the Chrome is peeling off a pipe when you first fire it up. Literally. Yeah, yeah. It's insane. And it's hard to, you know, like, if you want to build a solid Chrome bike right now, you know, when someone like Arlen S is doing Chrome wheels, they're doing a fucking batch of wheels, right? So it makes it more affordable to do it. But when I'm like, man, yeah, I want to just Chrome my mid-controls, it's like... It, to get a good chromer anywhere it's it's outrageous priced um it's almost not even worth it it's just worth it to find somebody that that maybe made some mid controls and mass produced it and had them in chrome or some shit like that but i don't know i dig it i mean it's just a breath of fresh air i mean it's almost like whatever harley does everybody does the opposite if they black out the bikes people want to color you don't want the chrome because the whole bike's chrome and yeah and the guy with the black bike wants chrome and i'm like well now you're married to it you got to do every you can't just yeah chrome exactly bike. <laughs> it's a shit show, man. And it's funny because I was, I'm a product of that too. I went in like forever. Everybody wanted black, so I have like all like if I find extra rockers at the swap meet, I'm buying them because I don't want to wait two weeks for for powder coat. So mm. like you'd come in and I'd be like, take all your chrome shit and have everything in black to put on your bike. Yeah. Now I got to go all those parts hanging on the wall, wrapped in cellophane because they're ready to go in black. They're not really being used that much. Mm. Now it's it's like Chrome again. Exactly. And so I'm back to like seeing my Chromer a lot more and, you know, and being on his ass. He's <laughs> well, like, yeah. I haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, I know. It just The powder coater sees me every day because everybody wants black. <laughs> but we do have this bronze color. It's kind of hot right now. Everybody wants. Yeah, that's hot. Anything. I don't know. <clears throat> it's like you said, the most people when they do it, they're going to do every piece. Like they're going to like Chrome it out or bronze it out or gold it out. It gets distasteful though. Sometimes you got to do it right. You got to pick your Less battles. Is more, in that shit. right? Yeah. You got to do it in a tasteful manner, and you got to like kind of use it as a highlight, not really as a as a like as the main a piece. course. Yeah, it's got to be like the side dish. Mm hmm. Agreed. That's how I see it. What, what else did we not cover? We covered performance. Mm hmm. We covered some chopper stuff. Yeah. Um, we covered. We talk about the shop. Like I said, I'm going to be moving. Like, that's my, my biggest thing. So all this fell out on my lap recently at the same time with the yeah. shows coming up. So I want to apologize to a lot of people. I don't post much lately. I haven't been... I'm in this, like, where am I standing right now? This place will be gone tomorrow. So when I come to work, it's, like, very, mm -hmm. very hard to even create anything right now. Like, my easiest jobs lately have been repair work because you don't have to yeah. really think. 
yeah. just like fix the problem yeah you don't yeah you creating use. has been hard um and i do have a lot of engraving waiting to, for, for customers and a couple builds i'm doing luckily luckily the fxrs for me are kind of like mm-hmm. my my go-to right now there's still ideas i haven't done oh that's good the choppers i'm kind of like what else can i can i, pop? I like i built the bike with all the ideas put into one mm-hmm. like almost like you ran out like yeah and then the fxrs kind of fell in my lap and i was like this is my next venture and then we went into production parts our parts are doing great like they're yeah. selling like hotcakes everywhere we're in harley dealerships we're in plenty of mom and pop shops i yeah. have four distributors around the world so that's you know keeping up with that something that i also hated was instagram and like the whole social media thing where like my bit my best asset was having a, a mechanic or someone fabricating with me so when i'm stopping like doing this it's being still like, getting done yeah like every business i think like the best thing is like your go-to guy like your main chief mechanic chief mm-hmm. fabricator whatever now the best asset is some guy that knows how to use the phone take photos and post that shit. you're just talking about this morning that that is like kind of like what every business needs where it used to be the opposite i don't give a fuck who's yeah who's so you know <laughs> My, my mechanic from Japan who's a fucking engineer like no one gives a fuck about that yeah like can you fucking post can you can you take a good photo that's kind of where it come down to I hate it but it sucks that it's all changed that way but it's you know you know I, I do a lot of photography I wouldn't quite call myself a photographer yet but that is a big passion of mine and you know being on a trip like this it's hard because like I kind of need the photos of like we're you're showing me shit at your shop I need some shots of us talking about it just to kind of create like the atmosphere of For what sure. it's about but i'm the photographer <laughs> so it's kind of like all right well i'm not going to be in it which i don't really give a fuck about being in the photos anyway but it's just one of those things where when you're trying to uh be in the guy behind the camera but also the guy that needs to be in front of the camera is hard what's up guys i need to drop in real quick and give a big thank you and shout out to thunder max efi for helping me make this podcast trip possible. I just got home from a 28 day, 7,200 mile bike trip where I at least filled up my gas tank once a day. My 131 was humming through the desert, mountains, forests, and even plenty of rain. The Thunder Max ECM kept my bike running and operating like a champ with its auto tuning technology, the elevation, humidity, and temperature changes never affected my bike's performance. Their ECMs are a must for anyone looking to add all the go-fast goodies to your EFI-equipped Harley-Davidson. My Rogue Glide is paired with the Thundermax cooling fan, which is available for the Touring M8 models. Lane splitting in California's traffic and heat gets the motor oil hot, but with the fan, I was able to keep my bike's temps in the safe zone. Check out all these amazing products at shopteammax.com. And when you're ready to make the upgrade, use Fast Life at checkout to save yourself 10%. Now let's get back to the show. Well, I'm one of these days you're going to be the fucking chef that walks in the kitchen and everything's already set up. I mean, that's kind of... I day. mean, it's, you're big enough to do it. You're, you're like the leader of this shit right now. I'm trying. <laughs> well, you're, work, you're putting the work in. That's not easy yeah, to come it's, out um, here and do this, you know, a bunch of people I already know. Yeah, it's a, it's a bitch. It. Every day, it's uh, you know, we had a we had a schedule at this time. Then one ran long, fifteen minutes later. Now this dude's like, ah, I don't have the time. Like, it's and it's like I'm riding across country right now. Like I'm on a bike, you know, like all my shits off the bike at at my aunt's house right now. So it's like it's you know someone you know you come into town like right now we it's what Tuesday morning. Like fortunately, you're like yeah, I can I can fucking chop it up with you for a couple hours, versus like if you had like 20 employees over there and you just didn't have the ability to kind of step away for a minute and have this conversation it's i get it it's hard but i also can't sit here till 10 o'clock at learn night. how it goes yeah like yeah. i tell my guy starting monday which was yesterday you're gonna have tourists and fucking yesterday germany showed up french people showed up they're already here for born free oh yeah uh, it's a week early yeah and you called me and there's luckily this year we're not in born free we're not actually building like or doing building. anything so like usually we have a pre-party at the shop like nice. the, like this thursday would be like our normal like born free party free, which is a shit show I, I wouldn't have had time but this year i took the time i'm gonna ride out i'm not mm-hmm. not in a car i'm gonna be on my bike nice 
Dude, that's fucking awesome, man. I like the dude the, the the shop vibe. I don't even have a grass pass. I don't even know where I'm going. <laughs> I'm just going. Just say you're fucking the manager or something. You know what I mean? No, I just roll right to the gate. And they're like, "What's up?" I feel like my. Foot. I'm like, "Come on, get in." Come on, dude. We know. I just you. can't show up with thirty people like last year. They're like, who, who and all <laughs> um, but do the shop. I mean, I, this is my first time going in the back, and I just briefly saw it. It's fucking rad. That like that's like the kind of shop that you just you know you would see in a magazine. You're just taking pictures. Like there's so much shit on. Uh, I say shit in a good way. No, there's shit. just so much shit on the wall. There's so much to look at and. You know, some of it I have no fucking idea what it is, but I'm like, oh, it looks good. It's like the perfect. So I was a hoarder. Yeah, it's of, a hoarder's decoration. Parts, and now I'm a hoarder of FXR parts, and the shop's just way too small to hold all this shit. Yeah. I mean, those big fairings I collect, mm -hmm. those, the, I have some peas and stuff up there. It, it's like you need two shops or a giant fucking place yeah, to do yeah. FXR. And I do cars too, so I also have my LS motors in there, my front clips over here because I'm doing cars. So, like I said, this could be a blessing in disguise as time to move because now I know what I need. Like, imagine, like, the whole shop was set up to be fabrication. I got my machine shit here. Mm -hmm. I got, you know, all my dirty, like, cutting wheels and all yeah. that cutting station and then assembly. But then you build FXRs. Now you got motors. You got these fucking expensive yeah. parts. It's, it's a whole different atmosphere. And the shop wasn't built for that. It was built to, like, grind here, polish here, and then assemble here. It, was, it wasn't, like... There's no room for like tearing a motor apart. Oh yeah. And having three bikes like that, and then you know you're waiting for parts, so the bike has to come off and go wait somewhere while working on another bike. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like I'm I'm already thinking of the new shop. It's gonna take me probably a year to build it out. Mm -hmm. It's gonna have a car lift. It's gonna have just a parts department, which I've never had. Yeah. Just you know how much parts we carry now. Like just I, I have. You need a rebuild kit for a master cylinder for an FXR Dyna. I have it. Yeah. You need um, just just gaskets alone man like, like I just had panhead shovel head gaskets before mm -hmm. now I got Evo twin cams yeah. soon to be M8s yeah I never touched an M8 to Harley gave me one for real I don't know if you saw it but I built a 2021 lowrider mm -hmm. oh yeah yeah I saw it yeah it's at, it's at the dealership in Glendale right now it's on display mm -hmm. but we get calls every day about that bike because it's pretty much like a, I did what I would do to the FXR I dished the tank I trimmed all the fat off of it mm -hmm. put a swing arm made some custom one of a kind wheels and then I put a, a three-quarter fairing that I made some brackets to fit the normal headlight bracket. So yeah. it's not much. But I built it within thinking, like, people are going to want this. So I'm already in the process, in the process of, making of making those parts. Yeah, it's so, smart, you know. Well, they tell me at the dealer I get good input, you know. Mm -hmm. Like three times a day people want to buy this bike, you know, build this one. So now I'm going to build them one so they can sell it. But between me and you and whoever's listening, like, I'm, just, I'm against the new stuff. I'm a... I'm a heart my heart and soul is vintage yeah yeah so if i do do a new bike you know damn straight i'm trying to make it look old the the, the scheme of the bike i mean at least the paint colorways or whatever yeah it's gonna have to look like it's something it kind of gives it a more timeless look in a sense you know because, because that's what harleys are yeah at the end of the day minus the technology they put into the new bikes it's heritage it's like yeah it's oil on the ground under the bike i mean you can easily make an old leak that's not too, you just leave no. it untongued <laughs> fuck that gasket up <laughs> no, a little it's bit. hard to see a harley that doesn't leak it's like weird <laughs> oh man it's awesome well yeah I'm, I'm stoked man i i think uh whatever you end up doing with the shop i mean you have a you have an artistic eye for the bikes you build for the space that you operate i mean even you know the art you have in your house you know it's dope as hell you know that kind of shit is cool and it, it bleeds through you obviously you know what i mean yeah I'm inspired by the smallest things in, war in the world. Like, mm. I'm, I'm inspired by a salt pepper shaker if I see a cool one. <laughs> yeah. You know? I'm like, how can this look on a bike or something? It's, I'm being exaggerating, but, but there's, there's a lot of it. Like, a lot, you see it a lot more in my choppers, like, stuff that I've used. Like, I've taken parts off of an oven one time and used it on a bike. I've taken parts off of random shit, you know, go-kart parts to, you know, back in the day, I was using a lot of British parts on Harleys, a lot of Indian parts on mm -hmm. Harleys. Just cool Making shit. Yours, yeah. And in the old bikes, you can do whatever, man. You can take a fucking whatever, add it on your exhaust. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, it makes it all right. <laughs> They're straight pipes. But now with performance, it's like just when you think you know it all, you there's something new to learn. Yeah, it just adds a new... Uh, wow, well, new... I'm lucky, man. I'm lucky that people have given me money to build my dream bike for them. And that's kind of what it comes down to. That's badass. <laughs> you know? Every now and then we get the guy that's like, you know, hey, you know, this is, you know so-and-so's bike can you do something like that like, I mean, you can go to him and have that done yeah for sure you know you come here you get this burger you go over there burgers are all different everywhere you go 
you know, ours is a little bit more expensive, a little bit more quality. You got your homemade burger, you got your In-N-Out burger, you know, you got mm-hmm. your cookie cutters. I try to like, you spend a little more, obviously, when you come to boutique shops, but you're not going to see another one like it, you know? Yeah. That's kind of like what I tell people. You're paying for the one-off. Yeah. Yeah. What's the P16 stand for? I can't tell you guys. Okay. But it's it's just a short thing for power plant because I it got to the point where like riding power plant was just it's too long, big and yeah. I like coming from like graffiti world to just like do shit but it, yeah. it's it stands for power plant it does things behind it it's it's personally that's cool yeah. no 16 year olds were being raped though I, tell you. <laughs> I can tell you that fuck them kids but it's like it's just a code thing oh that's cool and I, I we lost a couple homies that died with that shit and that's fine it's, yeah, that's dope, man. It, it's a it's a good little flavor. I'll tell you guys off the off the record. <laughs> that's all good. Well, man, uh, we can wrap this up, dude. I really appreciate the time, dude. Yeah, and man, my pleasure. And I tell them where to find your. I want to interview you guys. Like, what the fuck? Is, so far, have you seen on this trip? Uh-huh. And and B, like, how's this this show? Is like, like I want to start putting it on my thing so I can listen to it. You I can. don't listen to podcasts enough. Yeah, I, I mean, to, uh, like one when I was breaking up with my baby mama. Mm-hmm. And how to like get along with raising a child. <laughs> That's about as much of a podcast as I've listened to. But to have a motorcycle is kind of badass. Yeah. You know, uh, to, to hear what I just said or maybe other builders. Yeah, we've definitely their got. perspective because I don't get to, you don't get to do that. It's a, it's a lot of this sh- shooting the shit. The, his studio in Dallas is awesome. Just Joe Rogan for motorcycles. And it's a lot of fun, man. It's a lot of just getting get to know people. Can I come visit people's. one day if I'm there? Dude, yeah, dude. Whenever. Come on. Yeah, the, the studio's... Little, little powwow fucking... The studio's like a... It's a live experience. So while we're sitting here, we you know, we got table. You know, I don't know if you drink, but we got drinks. Um, lighting, it's... Dude, cool. I didn't offer you guys anything. No, that's fine. No, it's early. Do you guys smoke weed or anything? Can oh, I roll yeah. a joint? Should I roll us a joint? He'll yeah. smoke. I'm... All I'm right. a little bitch when it happens. <laughs> okay, well, I'll give you some for your trip because uh, my boy, you know Jason Jesse, by the way? Uh, man, honestly, I was going through his neck of the woods. I don't know him personally, but I wanted to reach out to him. You should do a thing with him here. So there's some joints. Uh, Jason just did this. That's his little thing. And nice. I get a lot of that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's for you. And then, um, let me get my little tray. Oh, yeah, I know this dude. Joint. Skateboarder. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's one of my best friends. He's the godfather of my child, too. So Badass. Him, do, uh, yeah, he's up there in, like, Santa Cruz area, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he's not only up in Santa Cruz, but he's uh, also just a good good friend that's, like, mm-hmm. he's uh, we're, I'm trying to get him to go to Thailand with me right now. They they told me if I can bring him as a judge, um, they would be glad to have him. So he's never traveled like that. So I'm trying to convince him to get vaxxed and uh, get his passport. Um, but uh, maybe Jason would be a good person to have on this. Oh yeah, I'd, I'd, make, I'd, I'd love to probably just, make it happen for I you. I didn't really have the 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 way to you know I cold fucking message you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes that's uh sometimes people respond like you did. Sometimes I get left on red. You know it just happens. But um one day we'll get a publicist and they'll be hitting people up. <laughs> well one one day you'll have a studio out here. You could come do this on the west coast. My friend has one, and uh, if we ever need to set up something in a studio here too, man, you're welcome to just uh, yeah. just ask me uh, if it makes your life easy to have. It does. Come in. Um, you know, the hard part about coming out here is there's so many people that you want to talk to, and so many different brands, and they're you know they're not as spread out here as they are in NorCal. Um, yeah, but I'd say, still, I'd say they're all within a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, like it's pretty San Diego easy. Would be the, there's no like big body of water or huge mountains in between things. You know what I'm saying? It's it's pretty uh it's pretty easy to get around here, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, we um you know reach out to a couple people, you know try to see if the schedules work cuz you know I'm also not trying to be out till fucking 2 in the morning doing podcasts and then getting back, getting you know what I mean? So tomorrow morning I got to be at fucking Basani on the other side of town, so I got to pack my bike out, then we're moving our little operation over towards like, Anaheim. Yeah. I'm lo- I'm looking forward to Are it. Are you doing uh with Mr. Basani himself? Mm-hmm. Daryl, I guess. Yeah. Fucking Daryl. That guy's got. And we stories. got a uh, Danny G. You know him, huh? Mm-hmm. He's supposed to be coming on in uh, probably. Is he with Thursday. Van still? I mean, it's been. I years. think so. Yeah, I think so. If I remember correctly, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's always tough, and you know, I I don't know as many people in the chopper side of things as uh, as you know, say Danger Dan, guys like that are. You know what I'm saying? But I know of things, so. 
Um, well, I, I'm people's go-to sometimes. They use me to get to people to get, not use me like that, yeah. but you know, like introductions. Yeah. yeah. So like, if you need anything, I'm sure you know all the right people. But if you ever have any specifics, um, I also know a lot of the surf skate big yeah. heads out here who anybody I kick it with that's into skate is into motorcycles as well mm -hmm. my best friend is Steve Olson the legendary skateboarder mm -hmm. he's usually here I thought he would do a, a surprise visit <laughs> but he's got an art show this weekend but he's like one of the OG skateboarders from the 70s he was world champion in 79 and uh, also believe it or not I get inspired to do bike stuff from these guys too For real. they've been riding bikes when I was a kid mm. And they were riding back then. They ride to New York. They'll ride, you know, they'll do yeah, real trips. Like we're, what, I, what we do is nothing compared to how they rode. And the bikes they rode were piece of shit. <laughs> they didn't have anything like what we have now. It was crazy seeing how that the skateboard culture just morphed into the vintage shopper culture of the, you know, early 2000s and mid. You know what I mean? Like it all just came together. A lot of the guys that when I was in the 90s skating you are riding bikes right now. And they have like their own vibe. You know what I'm saying? Um, a lot of guys that shouldn't have bikes have bikes right now, too. That's, that's something I see. Yeah. And, and for the wrong cause. Because I'm the guy, who, like, you, you'll have 50 grand to drop on a bike, and I'm like, why are you getting a bike? And it's, if it's not the right reason, I wouldn't, yeah. I'm like, don't, don't even do it. Yeah. You're going to kill yourself. And it's most, most of the time, because, oh, I'm going to take some girl on a ride, or I want to, like, they won't admit it, but I can feel the reasoning is not a good, valid excuse to own a bike. Yeah. And if it is a bike, it's not going to be one of my bikes or a Harley, let alone. You know, go get a, go get a fucking weekend cruiser or something like that. Go rent a bike. <laughs> Tell people, go to Pismo Beach, rent a quad, you know, take your girl on a little fucking rail or whatever, have fun. Mm -hmm. Eat shit a couple times before you, because if it, when you feel what it does to you, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's no joke. Some like, a guy... I can't even say it, but the guy just bought a Dyna for me. Don't don't put this up. 25 G's, right? Fuck it, say it, whatever. 25 G's. Never seen the bike, never seen me, never met me, wants to meet me, and I'm like, it's a fucking T-Sport. Yeah. You know what you're buying? He's like, dude, I fucking got 100 horsepower on my Sportster, Mackie heads, this, that. He lives in somewhere out there in the East Coast. And then uh, I'm like, all right, fine. And you know how to ride. You got a Mackie motor? So I tell him, I think, I think it's a one- 13 on the bike mm -hmm. or 117 from what okay. I was told but we didn't open the motor yet sorry let's take a hit of this That's fine. so fucking we open the motor it's a 113 mm -hmm. now he already gave me a deposit he calls Mark my guy that motherfucker told me it's a 117 now it's a 113 you guys changed the plan I'm like we, I wasn't sure <coughs> fuck it dude mm -hmm. like, he's like I want it to be a big motor and I'm like Bro, you're not gonna, this thing's fast, I'm fucking scared on it. Like, yeah. it's bad. He's like, yeah, but you said it was a one, anyways, we get him to the point where it's like, he's cool with the 113. He, he's like, I'm gonna fly out, bought his ticket, you're gonna be around, I'm like, yeah, this weekend, come by. Flies in, brings the whole entourage, fucking gets on the bike before he hits the alley. He lets go of the clutch on a turn and d dumps the clutch. And I can already hear that, like, he's, he's not letting go of the clutch all the way. I can, like, when he took off, I'm like, wait, he said he knew how to ride. And then, wham, I hear the bike just redline. He dropped the bike, pinned it <coughs> for three seconds on the bike. And I'm fucking running fast as I can around the corner. And there's the bike and him on the ground. Oh. And I'm like, he's like, bro, I underestimated the fucking power of this thing. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's just a 113. You still want to do a 117? Like, I'm doing 140 on this thing. If you can do 140 on this bike, I'll give you your money back. I don't, it's not for you. But it's that type of shit. Yeah. It's because they, bigger the better. 131's all out there on Instagram. Like, fucking ride a bike, really, man, before you get into it. You know, like, especially these these death traps that we're building. Like, you know, these, <laughs> these Dynas yeah. and FXRs are fucking, they're not. They're fast. Like, they're bad. Yeah. And there's no, there's, there's no traction control or anything. You're fucked. <laughs> and so this guy, yeah, this guy went from like he has a hundred horsepower Sportster to this thing, and then the clutch is too tight, and I'm like, bro. Yeah, he doesn't know what he's getting for sure. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> and I'm not, you know, if if he does end up hearing this, like this isn't a knock. Yeah, yeah. On anything, but it's just to to show people like 
Instagram's a hype. Everything's everything's an embellishment of what it is. And motorcycles are definitely cool on Instagram, and hot chicks like it, and we know all that. Yeah. But like, really know what you're doing when you're getting into this shit because, um, and a chopper is probably even better to have because you know you kind of like are forced to drive 80 miles an hour. Yeah, it, it makes you slow down a little bit and stuff, and it's there's no I don't know at least the way I look at there's not a there's no hit to your pride to kind of stay in your lane and learn and you know what I mean you have to crawl before you walk and the whole thing and yeah. just stay my, in your lane dude my, you can always get faster but my best and I thought I was a good rider because I literally rode my whole life since I was like probably under 10 years old I was already shifting but when I got good it was when I rode with the HAs for real my friends when well, my friend was used to be in the clubs I don't like to mention clubs because yeah. there's so many friends in different clubs but I think we all know those motherfuckers can ride yeah, yeah. and I went on a ride with them one time and it looked like they were pushing the buses out of the way. When they're riding, mm -hmm. it was like the bus, the bus was like moving faster because they're on the ass. It, it was weird. It was like, it, and when you're on the freeway, it's like we're all like ballet dancing together because everyone, yeah, just, yeah, and guys would go in, and you know, usually like people cut them off, and people get all mad or start flexing. These guys, nothing. You ain't touching us. Cops don't slow us down. Cars that cut us off, we just go right around them. No one gets upset. Like when I ride and someone cuts me off, sometimes I get upset. Yeah. But I also know we know what we're doing. We're on a bike because yeah. you expect that. You expect that person to merge into your lane. I expect that parked car to do a U-turn right in front of me because it's happened. Yeah. Like you, you think, oh, he's parked, but then no, he's not. And exactly. Like every car is a is a fucking obstacle, even if they're parked. Yeah. And that's how I ride. Like you play Pac-Man, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. They're gonna fucking come up behind you and eat you if you don't. So I try to stay exactly moving ahead, of everyone faster. Yeah, and have my little I don't know twenty feet around me that's clear, and that's my my whole thing. You know, don't be in no man's land. Just always be like in that. Like, what's your favorite thing to do here on a bike? Like, is it the nighttime cruising through these streets, or what do you what my, you do? My favorite is this time of the year, about six o'clock, finish mm -hmm. work early and ride to PCH and jump in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Like, we just bring a towel and just jump in the ocean about 6 o'clock. The water is perfect. Go get some fish tacos and ride back. That's, like, it's all I need, really. It's a 20, 30-minute ride. Wait, you just way. go straight down Sunset all the way through? I like through. Sunset, yeah. and then when you're in a hurry to get back, you just jump on the freeway. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of, like, my favorite time is that evening, this this hot nights. Yeah, yeah. T-shirt. That's how but my favorite riding, as much as I hate to admit it, is the, is, is the city, like splitting lanes. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I dig it, man. I need, because I only need like 30 minutes of that versus a fucking three day long trip or three, like a weekend, you know, leave in the morning, come back at night. Yeah. Like yeah. Th I get the same feeling just going like 30, 40 minutes here. Yeah, in Dallas, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of bridges that go across our little river that goes, it's not really a river, but you know, it's there. And uh, man, when the sun starts going down, our city lights up pretty pretty well, like kind of like Vegas. You know, there's lots of colorful lights on the, our buildings, and uh, all the bridges are on the west side of town. So when you're coming across them and you see the city, you got the lights on the buildings, but you also got the the reflection of the sunset going down on all the glass buildings. And it's I don't know, it's just like that perfect, like almost like I key some synth say, wave. I've been in Texas. My brother lives there, yeah. but I've never ridden a bar a bike there. Yeah, yeah, it's never. fucking wild. I can't speak on like Austin or Houston, but Dallas, Dallas is a little bit. Uh, you know we, you know we have Oliver Peck there. We got a nice little bar district, lots of cool areas, and two, uh, three little bar districts. Yeah, Dallas is a fun fucking town to come visit. For yeah, is there Listen, good weed it, over there? Uh, yeah. So the so stuff I get the good like the, I know like all the designer weed from here they ship to like all these little states that hard to get, but yeah, there's still good stuff. Yeah, um, I brought some, which is I wouldn't say it was like I was trying to bring the best. And the California dudes that they're like, all right, let me see it. And they go, I thought it'd be worse. So I took it as a compliment. And yeah, <laughs> maybe bring your own. But yeah, it's uh, there's it's there for sure. So what do you think about this Born Free? I'm, I'm stoked. This will be my third Born Free. No, 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 no not this one. Yeah. Oh, the one in Texas. Yeah. Um, I'm stoked that it's coming to Texas. I think that uh, I, I think that people need to come to this Born Free in Texas with like an open mind because it's not going to be born free the way it is here it's That's why we want to come there exactly so right um i made that mistake before you know the first chopper show i went to was giddy up and then i go to giddy up and then i come to california and i'm i'm wanting born free to be giddy up because giddy up was amazing right 
So I'm like, ah, oh, it wasn't that great. But I was like, you know, it is great. I just, I didn't, I wasn't open minded to let Born Free be what Born Free is, right? I'm stoked. It's gonna be cool to see a lot of the bikes come out. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see how. Um, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just stoked it's in the backyard. I don't have to fucking go across the country to get to it. And I'm hopefully gonna see a lot of brands like yourself and people out there that are, you know what I mean? When are, are they doing that? When are they? Picking, October. Like, oh, it's, this year. So if you had a reserve a booth, it's already done. I, I think they're pretty open. There's so much space there, and you know Texas, you can get away with murder out there. So they're not. I know, I know Oliver. That's good. Yeah, it'll help. <laughs> um, can I interview you for a second? Yeah, what's up? Okay, so how long have you been riding? Uh, I got my first bike in 2004. Really? Uh, how I was. Old are you? I grew up. Um, I'll be 40 in two months. Oh, okay. So yeah. I, uh, I grew up in a paint and body shop, and then got a job working at a place wet sanding gas tanks for Rick Fairless and and their all, all the choppers. Oh, so you shit. actually worked for him? I worked for the shop that did all the paint work. Okay. And uh, while working at this shop that was just nothing but motorcycle paint, that's all they painted was bikes. I'm like, this is fucking cool. You know, and I was into the import cars and shit before that. How's that weed? Are you getting too high? I don't know. Oh, yeah, this shit fucking creep up on you. <laughs> that's the OG Kush right there. Yeah. Um, so being around the paint obviously brings you to a point where like you're not just riding, you're actually like working on bikes, right? Like, you actually get to kind of like. Well, it made me want to buy a bike. And then as I buy a bike, I start wanting to work on them because I have them. You know, I've always been hands on mechanically. And the people you're around yeah. and everybody, right? Yeah. So. So 2004 makes it 20 years. 18 years right now. Right. 18 years. And you never had a bike before, like dirt bikes or anything? No, I didn't grow up really? in the. In, are not you, really. And what's your riding thing? Like a daily thing? or? I mean, like then. Did you commute with a bike? I did. For, yeah. for I mean, there's been plenty. There's Over the last 18 years, I guarantee you, there's been at least 10 year span, uh, maybe off and on, where all I owned was a motorcycle to and get I, around. And where I'm going with this whole thing is how versatile of are you with your um, bikes? Like, are you. Did you get into like early stuff first? Uh, no, I, I grew up on sport bikes first because I couldn't, you know. After talking to so many people on this podcast for so many years, guys like yourself, even your story, you're around that like at a young age. So you kind of get introduced to Triumphs and, uh, you know, the, the vintage shoppers, you know, whether, or just vintage Harleys, right? Uh, Shovelheads and shit like that. that. That wasn't my world, right? Our world was the only people that I was around was the $100,000 choppers they would build back in the day. And then if I wanted to get a bike, well, I can afford this 2004 Honda F4i for three grand, right? So I did that for until 2010, you know, and uh, still which, painted bikes. Which and, isn't too bad because um, I think your your best skill of riding were, mm -hmm. is to get one of these yeah, Ford bikes. Yeah. Because otherwise you're wrenching. Yeah, exactly. It's weird. It's like I got, in, I got into riding, so I knew, already knew how to ride when I started wrenching on them because mm -hmm. I did have a honda and i had a yamaha and yeah and i had you know a lot of dirt bikes and it was i mean gsxr was one of my first bikes yeah in high school yeah i had three of them that, that ended up being the bike of choice for me it was a jixer so so now you got your you know shifting power uh mm -hmm. what do you call it when you downshift to slow down like yeah, a, downshifting all that. but then you learn okay you can't do that on harley so it's like now you're starting to be more versatile and and you're riding and then uh I think those are the real, real riders. Is the ones that like know. Yeah, like you, I mean, you can't without a bike. You know, you're not the same person without a motorcycle. Oh, for sure. So I, you know, you have that most of your life, right? Twenty mm -hmm. years, eighteen years. It's a good portion of half of your life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you'll you'll ever be the same without a motorcycle. It's different with some of these uh, people that we meet. Yeah, um, but, but I, man, I love this stuff. But are you ever going back to those kind of bikes now that you're no, on Harley? Uh, no, because I you found I mean, your your like niche. Yeah, let me put this closer to you. Um, they, uh, I, I did everything backwards. I went from sport bikes to, at the time, especially in Texas, like the big wheel bagger thing was huge, right? And so that's, as a painter, that's where all my money came from. So I ended up getting into that. And then I fell in love with traveling on a motorcycle on a big wheel. I, I did a, my first couple of cross country trips. Big trip. wheels, like a 26 inch yeah. wheel. Mm -hmm. All that shit. Stereos. Long trips? Long trips, rode to San oh, Francisco shit. a couple times. Um, a lot. What's of that shit. like? It's fucking awesome. On your back? Yeah. Are they better comfy? Than, it's better than the FXR. <laughs> as far oh. as like comfortable. Because you, because 
uh, your adjustable suspension like yeah, it, yeah, so yeah, you, you're cru- so you're cruising yeah, like, it's like riding a Cadillac down the highway <laughs> now when you get to the places you want to go rip you ain't doing that I mean you're right. you're going through I rode PCH twice with a big wheel bagger and scarred the fuck out of my stretch bags and all that shit but I did it you know question hmm. I've never been on long trips or any road trips without bikes breaking down mm-hmm. those bikes do they do you the have big to wheels, stop every like because uh, well, to me in my opinion custom bikes are just the types of bikes that you need to constantly maintain yeah yeah, yeah. pull over with all the bags and all that so, craziness do you have th- these like issues of like, originally shit and originally whenever we started doing them uh we would have typically we would have air ride issues because air ride at the time there was a company that was making them they used to use corvette shocks like these uh just to basically take it, you get a Corvette shock from fucking uh, like it's eighty four Corvette. Really, they're everywhere. There's, they're real common shocks on a lot yeah. of G bodies and shit. And then all you do is like weld this one little piece eyelet situation, and they bolt right up, and you put air to it, and it's a badass little airbag system on baggers. So it's a it's it's the Corvette shock already has the inlet for air mm-hmm. to be an adjustable height. Yeah. Yep. Oh, so and that's so way cheaper, up, probably yeah. way to do so it. So you you could do like a, a rear air ride kit on these baggers for fucking. Uh, you know 400 bucks you know what i'm saying so back in the day we were doing that that's the only issue i've ever had on a bagger was air ride and so we stopped i stopped doing air ride on baggers because i traveled on them and then i stopped doing big stereos because then if you're blasting your stereo you could fry your electrical system and things like that so for for the long trip yeah so i, I mean I, I used to build the bikes build that's air quotes crazy. You guys for like that. that and uh but that that world never really gave a fuck about traveling it, it was a money thing it was about you know how big your wallets were and then it was what were what those uh, bikes end up costing those shit approximately I've, for me like, what's i never the cheapest and most expensive you could bit? probably get into it for 20 grand ish but you know most really? of them yeah if you had the bike already 20 grand gets you all the parts you want to make it look that way um so the bike plus 20 grand yeah yeah so i mean it, it wasn't cheap at first but then it did get cheap it got you know ebay amazon uh you know knockoffs china knocking off everything it, it became what, like cheap ass forks and shit everything wheels shit wheels, wheels stretch bags because that was the thing oh was, the bags too yeah it's all the plastic shit everybody was making fiberglass and, and stuff like that but that means there's a lot of them being sold if they're re- oh it was big shit in china it was big it's like the t-sport fairing that they started doing that yeah. crater one mm-hmm. it's big man you see the uh, ones now with the glued on yeah chrome bezel yeah i've uh i've, I've ran plenty of those craters i put one on if someone thought it was real yeah <laughs> can't beat it half a, a tenth of the price basically but um yeah man I, I i just fell in love with riding but what what i what i fell out of love with with those bikes was the the demographic of people that rode it they didn't care about riding it wasn't about the ride it wasn't about the experience on the ride because this dude has one and they got yeah it, it was a it was a wallet game it was you know it was like hey check out my boat check out my razor check out my big wheel bagger you know there Damn. was no culture behind these bikes right yeah. And of course, I hadn't been yeah, I hadn't been exposed to the culture of bikes yet, and it wasn't. And I've said this story so many times on podcasts, I apologize, but it wasn't until I started getting commissioned to go to NorCal to paint bikes, big wheels, actually, that I'm in the shop painting a big wheel bagger, and all these, it's like every guy would have a big wheel and a Dyna, right? Really? Yeah, it's it was weird. I want to know who all those guys on the Dynas that have one at home. Yeah, have yeah, a yeah. big wheel at home. Because they wanted the big wheel, you know, up and I always and, thought they're a different character. Yeah, yeah. They kind of were, but at the same time, the big wheel for the NorCal scene was more, you know, the, the NorCal scene's big in the boats up there. Like, they got the Delta, they got a lot of that shit. Showboating. Exactly. So, the big <laughs> wheel was like a, a little flex, but when they wanted to go do a run or go to Dixon or Street Vibes, they jump on the Dyna and go do that, right? Um, but being up there, seeing them like that, because the Dynas in Texas at the time weren't that way. And I mean, yeah, I'm I'm a product of watching Sons of Anarchy and seeing that shit. Not that I was like trying to be that, but I was like, oh shit, it's just like those ones on Sons of Anarchy, right? That's my per- that's my exposure to it, you know. Everybody else, it was an ongoing joke for a while. Exactly. Anytime so then you see a fairing. <laughs> exactly. But you you know you start seeing it, and then you ride one, you're like oh this is fun, and then it, it, honestly, what really made me want to jump ship was the Instagram culture of the bikes. I mean, now it's kind of a cesspool, right? But in 2015 and 2016, a lot of it was fresh and new. It wasn't so played out with, you know, club style pages of every fucking brand or every state and city yeah. and, and county. Um, there was like, you had Dynaholics, you had a very few amount of FXR stuff. It was just a lot more niche based. And then 
what I loved about it is like I, I remember my first diner that I air quotes built. I rode it to Dixon Flannels. They had a, a bike night, or, or they had a party in Arizona, a little bike night. So I, I like dialed up this this diner and rode it out there solo. Knew some people from Instagram, but I was like, dude, this is the funnest. Like the the, the party got shut down an hour into it because they were out there doing stunts. So I just ended up linking up with some other cats that were there, and then we were all we're fucking mobbing all over Phoenix, going to bars. People were doing wheelies. It was like, oh, it's just like the fucking movies to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was hooked on the culture of these bikes, right? Yeah. So, honestly, for me, the culture of Harley Davidson and those motorcycles came to me in about 2015, 16. You know, and as I've been riding bikes forever, but I was riding and I was messing with a lot of bikes that were there, and you can have fun. Wheelie. Hmm? Donut wheelie thing started real big. Or I feel like it was starting to come 20, around. Twenty nineteen, maybe. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been way like no, like com- overly done. Where like everyone's. Well, doing. yeah, probably twenty nineteen is when you saw the sport bike industry of stunt riders. That's when my ego got crushed. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. I mean, everybody should because I were, used to do a whole shop. You're like, come on, do that fucking, you know, do a burnout, go sideways, like all day, and then these dudes started a wheelie. Like I would ride a small wheelie and pop it back down. I ain't doing that no more. Yeah. I'm embarrassed. These dudes, what they can do now is like it's it's like Olympics versus yeah. you know roller skating. Exactly. It's like there's an X Games feel to it. With how far are they going to take it? Yeah. Like when freestyle motocross kind of started getting big and started doing one backflip, and now they're up to three or four, yes. and it's just scary. Where are these guys? Scary because the it? other day on Instagram, some dude jumped that sports. Did you see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, all right. <laughs> all right it's crazy that bike's too heavy to be doing that yeah for real but i mean that's kind of the thing it's like uh you know and of course i mean it, it, i'm guilty of not like seeking out the culture of of harley davidson through the neck of woods that i was in but i'd also say then they're they're also guilty of not like making it available to see right but not everybody wants that too so you but know what happens when you see it is you try to do it yeah well <laughs> or you want to be a part of it you know what i mean like yeah. this I mean, as men, I feel like we're always looking, you know, especially at a young, impressionable age, we're looking for some sense of uh, belongings. With, like, what's my tribe going to be? You know what I mean? What, who am I? What am I supposed to be? Am I, am I going to be a greaser, a car guy, a, a skater, a surfer? A, am I going to be a, a band guy? Like, you know what I mean? Am I a sports guy? Yeah. Am I a frat boy? You know, like, said, said fucking characterization or generalization of anybody. You know what I mean? I don't think we all ask ourselves like, hmm, I guess I'm gonna be a, uh, you know, a preppy kid or some shit. Like, you just, who do I fit in with, and what speaks to me? It gives that you a good sense. feeling. Like, you get a feeling with pe- certain people. Yeah. Like where you belong. Yeah, and that's, and that's kind of what I mean. I feel like I'm, I'm in a, I'm a little old to be in something like this, but, you know, fuck it, I'm, I'm having fun. You know Never. what I'm saying? So. Because if if call it motorcycles is a language, then. You speak that language, mm-hmm. you're good at it. <clears throat> if being a salesman is your language and you know how to sell, then Fucking, yes. you're going, you know, I know a salesman who loves doing what he's doing. It's like his passion. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I can't relate to that. <laughs> you know, to me, it's, and I always, it's random motorcycle dudes, right? You'll mm-hmm. meet a dude that's like, like you'd never suspect that he'd be a good friend to you. Yeah. And you just talk to like and it's not about the look it's not about the color mm-hmm. it's it's weird and that's uh, man you got to travel you got to take your show yeah yeah I'm, if you I'm ever hoping. i got spots man around the world like i want to do something with that like i'm I, trying to all uh, these people i've met and where they live yeah and the kind of bikes they ride and what the what the food that they eat and the things that they do on their spare time like we do mm-hmm. is almost like your group of homies living in another country, mm-hmm. you, you just came to visit them. You already know them before you even meet them in real life. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like normal shit. Like, I'll pick up, like, shit, like, on the... Be like, oh, cool, I have shit like this at home. You know, like, yeah. it's weird. <laughs> yeah. And especially when you get into the garage and they start showing you tooling and, like, yeah. how they, like, hey, you know how I cut this? I saw your, your gas tank you made, but I did it this way. And it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. And I've then, always wanted- then you go hang out with them out yeah. of the garage have food and like it's talk much and- like uh you know like norman show right it, it's like that everybody I, I think myself included a lot of us wanted to do you know the the anthony bourdain on motorcycles yeah. right but I, I enjoy long form stuff and i you know I, I like a podcast because we don't have to you know set up like all these uh these these structured things it's just like bam 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 go 
You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a fucking hammering going on. There's sawing going on outside. It's it's real fucking life. I mean, we're not in the studio. This is a different version of the podcast. You know what I'm saying? So I like that aspect of like no time limit. No, you know, we'll wrap it up when it feels like it's time. And uh, and you go down these rabbit holes of conversations. And I and I like that about. I, I podcasts. think that's what it is. It's just more of the story. Yeah. Than the the what do you call it? The sizzle. Oh yeah yeah yeah. When you do a podcast with, I've done podcasts with some of those old heads, like the Yappies and things like that, and some of these guys have their story into sound bites. Like there's, there's, they've done so much media. Oh yeah. That, that, like you can say, hey man, so how'd you get started? And so like, I got started when I was like, they yeah. know how to like, and they talk. can, they can give you the fucking the, the 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 rundown in like 15 minutes. Yeah. And then for a podcast, so like nobody wants this to a 15 minute podcast. Yeah. No, right. A podcast to me is like. Like for like, I'm glad there's no cameras because like you can just forget that it's even being recorded. Yeah, yeah. And you're you as the host, I guess, right? You'd be the yeah. host. Kind of, you kind of want to know, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm interested, passionate to know what the back end of this whole thing or yeah. how it started, and and uh, it's not like hey, we got to just uh, you know answer X Y Z. I have a list of. Uh, it's it's almost like a spread in a magazine. It's Sometimes I wish I did actually like prepare questions for things. Like I couldn't do what you do because I, I don't know anything about yeah. what anybody's shit is anymore. Yeah, uh, I lost I lost touch with that. And that's and you have to be in touch with it. You that's know, the other thing is I, like I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm constantly. Um, I, I'm, I, I guess I use social media a little bit too heavily sometimes because I'm, I'm constantly seeing what everybody's doing. Right, I'm constantly in the know of what's going on. Of what I mean, there's still so much I don't know. I don't have access to and whatnot. But right. also, like I do, you know choppers pretty well. Like, like, uh, like, I know quite a bit about them. Yeah. Like if if you like had I don't know, I'm trying to think of a person that only deals with choppers. No, oh, yeah. Like maybe uh, Mondo, something like. that. I know a lot about Mondo. Would you have I would a definitely conversation have conversation with oh, him. Yeah. Like fuck yeah. Like about to be able to get that and sh- shit like that. I don't know if I'd be able to carry that conversation, but I could carry the conversation in the aspect of I understand what it's like to run a business. Yeah, you should get interested in, in like I want those to. early bikes mm-hmm. because y- your show would have like mm-hmm. the more I don't know more broad of like because Harley is a fucking crazy like yeah the history yeah, so much yeah and and especially if we want to geek out about the motors mm-hmm. um, there's so much. And I can see that they're two two different worlds. That's kind of why I wanted to ask you questions because well, yeah. So that what we try to do because we do have a, a young audience, and a lot of these guys don't know a lot about some of these brands or these older guys from the '60s and '70s and things like that. So we do try to bridge that gap here and there. But you know, Look it's up with them, man. Some yeah, of those yeah. guys are going to be dead soon. Exactly. Yeah. I got lucky. Uh, Indian Larry's been to my shop before he passed away. Wow. That was like, I used to just surf my bike because I'm like, well, he's dead and. I don't see anybody else doing it, so I'm going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I used to surf my my bike and call it Indian Larry when he used to call it Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's <laughs> fucking awesome. I went to a block party in 2020, in and uh, yeah, and yeah, El Surreal. You know, just being there, just the whole vibe of, of New York. I just uh, saw scene. the photos and videos. It was Bobby's shop. Uh, Seeger, yeah, yeah. No, he's a good friend. The only time I met him. I mean, I met him at Indian Larry's. Not the only time, but when I met him. Yeah. And the only time I went to the block party was his funeral, like a uh, memorial. Oh, yeah. Which was like... That's got I can heavy. just imagine how big their shit goes off. It's, it's almost like they kind of own it. They own it. Like, oh, yeah, definitely, man. Um, take fucking control of the street there. Oh, they definitely do. It's 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 like a little mini... I don't know if I'd say it's born free. his fucking face with a chainsaw into a, uh, ice. They brought it. He was cutting fucking Larry's face out of it. It was crazy. I was fucking tripping. Yeah. I was younger, too, so I was like... And the HAs were there, and fucking doing fucking whole shots, leaving. So, just, just getting into the scene, you know? Yeah, yeah, just definitely. Like, I, like I said, the first time I ever went to New York ever in my life was leaving Milwaukee, going to um, going through... Uh, Michigan meeting up with the Clem Speed Shop dudes, and we all went out there, to New York, and they introduced me to a lot of cats out there that, you know, some of them own tattoo shops, but they're building FXRs and Dinas and shit like that. And, mm-hmm. I, dude, the energy, just the, the the neighborhood, like, guy that has a shop behind his house kind of vibe, you know. You ever met Chris Kutis? I, I don't know how to say his name very well. He has a tattoo shop called, like, Three Kings or something like that. No. 
Dude, I'm sitting in his garage, and he's got like this. He's doing. He's building a Defender. I think it was. It's either Defender and FXR, one or the other. And he has. That's where I first saw the Japanese hot bikes and all the original oh, show really? classes back in the day. He had a fucking wall of them. I was like, dude, can I just chill in here for an hour or two? Like, yeah, I wish. Uh, I want you to get like into that shit. Because, I love it. Like one day I'll pull out some books and shit. Like mm-hmm. this, some cool old shit. Yeah. Like, um, it's kind of hard to to see now that we talked about this. I understand that it's some of that information should be on Instagram, but it's not. It's black and white. Yeah. You know, photography. Exactly. Sorry. Um, but it would be cool to like. It's almost like a different session. That's, yeah. That could be a five-hour-long session, right? Yeah, there. Yeah, you come to the studio, bring some of those magazines. We'll be able to pull all that shit up, and because even FXRs and Dinas are old, and they have you know history. some respect yeah. and history now. And just imagine some of those like older mm-hmm. dudes that died and built like crazy weird shit. Yeah, it's weird. Unwritable just, shit, you know. Yeah, just, yeah, for sure. You know, there's still Harley's. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, but no, that's 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 one. That's why this like the, this thing's ever growing. I mean, you'll probably be episode like two hundred and seventy something, I believe. Nice. So it's like, you know, we've been doing it consistently for the last, you know, four or five years now almost. And uh, Danger Dan as well. Dan, Dan's always been more fixated on the chopper scene, you know, and and then kind of uh, uh, tradesmen, dirt, dirt, dirt track stuff. You know, he's right now he just did that fucking inspiring ass ride to uh, Columbia, which I'm like wanting to do so fucking bad yeah that's one of the my goals is to do international travel after. i gotta design a shirt for him today oh you do yeah for his mc shop tees yeah oh i don't think anybody's supposed to know about that no aren't you on mc shop oh yeah i've been a subscriber for four or five years now really? i love them love them look forward to it every month yeah you got anything in mind that i think i should uh go with uh it's your you shop think? is it your shop that's the new? yeah okay but with his shit too I want to incorporate him in it I'll, I'll think of something it's been hard it's been hard to think <clears throat> but uh, he's a character and I met him in real life and I was like fuck because I follow him yeah yeah I was like this dude is chill as fuck he's cool as he's shit like, I just came back from uh, where was he like uh, South America broke down on his bike <laughs> I'm like Harley paid for that right he was no nah, dude I own the bike I did it myself I'm yeah. like fuck this should have given you a free bike and a camera. Yeah. Harley's That's, weird, man. He's we had a, a dude. He's a man. We had a dude in uh, Texas that rode a. He bought a brand new bike, brand new like road glide or whatever. Pulled it like left the dealership, and as he left the dealership, he you know, he did a hundred thousand miles in a hundred days on that brand new bike that he paid for, and accomplished it. And he was on Danger Dan's podcast. We had him on our show. What's his name? Uh, Chris Hopper okay. and uh, they all reached out to Harley and said hey man like this is a testament to your motor your M8 motor that just got built or that that, that you guys made no one's at the record before he did it was 40,000 miles in 40 days so you know Harley are you interested no they don't give a fuck about that he's an old white guy you know what I mean <laughs> we need diversity we need we need tits we need you know that to promote our brand nowadays no i i know it's sad it's not the same people anymore i just think if it doesn't matter who you are or what you are if you're doing something rad doing something that's hard you're making something that's that seems just it should all be rewarded equally it should all be like you know like homegirls i i, I think the builder for um born free this year uh, that saxel or axel or axel one? she built that bike that's fucking rad she's one of the first ones i don't know the story i don't know the whole details but i'm assuming she just built a fucking bike for born free and that's fucking cool yeah, right yeah there's uh there's a lot of cool shit out there man i just think that that's what is the most important is doing rad shit that should get exploited i always think it's the young the younger guys getting into it i used to be young and stupid and think like oh, i don't want them copying or whatever but then as you get older you're like this will die alone if you don't share <laughs> exactly you know yeah and i just saw that with my own eyes because i'm one of those guys who my mentors are going to be gone very soon mm-hmm. and god damn it i learned so much shit that no one gives a fuck about but you yeah but it helps you be who you are well your page your instagram page has always done well with 
inspiring that you know because i've got i've gotten inspiration from that so it's like exposing all the things that you build the way you build it those type of things it's like even if it's just a picture the picture's worth a thousand words in my opinion like i can take that picture and study it and be like fuck okay he did that man that you know fuck he did it now how am i gonna figure out my way to do it you know what i mean so yeah no i'd struggle with that every day yeah that's already been done fuck i thought of that but i can't do it now (laughs) You know, but um, there's always your way, and there's like I said, you can have so many different good hamburgers. You don't always have to, you know. Yeah, maybe you just. I was with my friend yesterday who was making burgers, and he's like, "I feel weird going to you know other homie who just started a smash burger place." Yeah. I'm like, "Well, his are smashed, yours aren't." It's like, he's like, "I know, it feels right." I go, "Now I know. This is like what happens when you're when you're chefs. This is what happens when you're bike builders." Yeah. But I think the best thing is like if you look at it like a. I don't know like how to explain it, but like a place you can come and have it all. Like SoCal, you come and you can see yeah, everyone yeah. shops, and we're all we're all peaceful and and everyone feeds yeah. off each other rather than try to like fuck each other over. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of like the good community about you know SoCal is like like I can call Cycle Zombies tomorrow mm-hmm. if I need something. They call me for things. Same yeah. with like all the kids that worked at the shop that now have their own shops. Mm-hmm. like they still come use my tire changer or I go to their shop and have them yeah. you know do stuff it's it's kind of cool yeah that's awesome and we all learn you know like one dude's better at something than the other guy mm-hmm. <clears throat> where if you keep all that shit to yourself you're kind of stuck in, in your own little I mean that's a, there's some builders builders that don't expose their shit out there at all that's motorcycle mania man you remember that when Jesse goes out and learns how to work with a copper oh, you yeah. know what I'm saying like that's straight <clears throat> that's the yeah. whole concept if you don't I mean, I guess it's hard for people to sometimes want to get to that point or have the time to share that knowledge and yeah. share that time to teach. But I'm engraving on my own from books and some YouTube shit, mm-hmm. really. Imagine then, tattoo artists, man. Remember, oh, I, man. before, I mean, now you can Anybody fucking get a get crash that. course on YouTube. Back in the, the day. The fact that you could get your hands on a machine. Yeah, you used to not be able to buy shit. <clears throat> yeah. You know? But Same with the engraving machine. I had to make my shit. I had to go get real? blueprints and machine a fucking piston with a barrel with a little thing on it. Wow. And now did they not, did I'm they about not? to take a course from the master himself. Nice. Who told me, him and CJ Allen, I don't know if you know, the guy from the East Coast was doing like engraving. Mm-hmm. And then you have Tay Herrera. That's the guy I know of. Tay. Yeah. Yeah. So he has been watching my Instagram and he says, like, I can use some, you know. That's awesome. Some tricks, and I was like, "You, you don't he's in NorCal, nobody. right? No, he's out here. He's, he's out, okay. like kind of Pomona area. Okay. And he's over here going like, yeah, I never wanted to really teach it to anybody. Mm-hmm. Never thought I would. It was like something I did, and mm-hmm. nobody else did. <clears throat> but when Alan died, he's like, he's talking to his daughter or something, and he said that they're talking about like who really does motorcycles now, because all the guys, there's some guys that are doing motorcycles, but they're like gun dudes or yeah yeah these guys are specific motorcycle guys that did a lot of that shit Mm -hmm. and so when they're gone that's it and just because you can engrave doesn't mean you can engrave motorcycle parts it's yeah all the metals all the shapes and how you hold everything this yeah this is why i struggle so he's gonna teach me so nice you know and i'm i'm 48 like i'm getting old Mm -hmm. i usually don't think at this age you're still learning and wanting to learn but i want to like get it all yeah dude you don't look 48 because I got to tattoo motorcycles, you know, that's kind of like... It's the vibe. Well, I think, yeah, that's like leaving really... Like, you cannot remove that engraving forever, you know? Yeah, that's dope, man. I yeah. dig it. It's fucking awesome. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to be too into another, <clears throat> you know, 10 years, but I hopefully, hopefully it's something that I enjoy doing. That's all I care about. You know I hope I mean? it's painting, man. Stick to that shit. That's, that's a dying art. Think about it. It is dying for a reason. I mean... <laughs> You know, fixing cars and doing that. The body shops, they have all the technology. You see all this shit they have now? Spray yeah, well, it's fucking... And all these suits and shit. And it's like, Yeah, wow. well, you know how hard it is to have a paint shop? Because because I paint motorcycles, they want me to have all that type of equipment. And there's not that kind of money in custom paint. You know, and then... I don't know. I, I love... I'm never going to stop painting, but I'm definitely going to downgra- downsize it to where it's uh, it's only a part of my thing. I... I like uh, so many other aspects. I actually, I, I if you had like your way of doing it, like you didn't mm-hmm. have anybody telling you paint this for me or that, like would you enjoy it more or is it? Oh yeah, and that's kind of what I'm at that. Too, that fucks you up. Or? No, it's not that. It, I'm, I'm, I have the best customers, and I'm pretty fortunate with the way I've set it all up. 
I am at a point now where, yeah, I can just paint my own shit how I want to do it and just sell it, and it'll be fine. And I get more money from helmets than anything these days. Oh, yeah? Um, we we kind of helped build, like, there's always been motorcycle helmet painters, but I, I feel like we kind of took it to the next level of people spending real money to get them done and kind of cherishing them, like, you know, you'll go to a guy's house and he has four of my helmets and one's from 2017, one's from 18, 19, 20. And we get a lot of collectors and things like that with our helmets. So, you know, that's kind of, I didn't really pick that to be my niche and my right, thing, but, but I fell into it and it works. And, and uh, you know, I can put all my effort into one shell as opposed to like, oh man, if I do all that, then there's 14 more pieces over here that I got to match it to, you know, but it's yeah for me like all the taping and shit when we do a bike mm -hmm. i because the painter is obviously not going to come here a lot he does come here once in a while and I, yeah, i'm yeah. like we need to so we do the tape lines on the bike mm -hmm. like those fxrs just you know some of it looks simple but like we do it because if you Make do it, it on flow, the table yeah. so i'll do the line and how it travels to the side cover and back over the fender mm -hmm. and he's like did i really need to come here for that i'm like yeah yeah because <laughs> Be I should be painting the fucking bike, so yeah, I'm not. Yeah. So I'm trying to like have them, and it gives you the comfort <laughs> knowing that yeah. all, all the shit's right. So, well, cool. You good? Yeah, I'm good. I want some water. Do you want some water? <laughs> I'm good, man. Actually, you guys want a banana? Like, uh, you want me to make you lunch? One sandwiches? No, I'm good, man. I appreciate it. I make good sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Well, yeah. I mean, we could we could uh, start wrapping this up. And say what you. Say where to find all your stuff, you know? What does that mean? <laughs> like how to find, like, the what's your website, your oh, that. social medias, and <laughs> um, shit like that. Well, yeah, the, the, so it's easy these days. You just, you know, look up someone's name, you can probably find them. But uh, my Instagram is PowerPlant, and from there it's kind of like just the website. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you and, sell a lot of, like, clothing, T-shirts, hats, things like that, too, right? Yeah, every now and then I'll do, like, you know, right mm -hmm. now we're kind of running low on things, so I'm going to start designing some T-shirts. I'm going to do the one with Dan. Yeah. And then I'm doing another collab with some friends. Some sunglasses are coming out soon. Yeah. Um, and then, like, it'll be like, like a drop like that. Mm -hmm. But the parts is where I'm, like, concentrating, so the parts live on the website now, and I'm trying to grow that. Yeah. Every year, at least two or three new parts trying to raise money to do more because i have a lot of cool ideas to make yeah, that's dope. to make stuff unfortunately it's not cheap and uh we're, we're our gas caps are like the biggest hit we have right now we mm, i remember those gas. has a like the has a little it's like very much my motocross gas cap that's on my dirt bike but yeah in yeah. metal not plastic and kind of more of a flare mm -hmm. <clears throat> but uh very inspired by a dirt bike i call it the mx gas cap and harley just ordered their fourth order with us and they're selling them in some of the dealerships and it's like that's dope it's dope it's mm. really cool it was just for fun you know <laughs> it worked out but yeah there's some of the parts are online and yeah if you are into the t-shirt stuff there's always something there but there's always like i never make the same t-shirt twice so there's always okay. going to be new variations of things That's, yeah i bought one uh like i said i came through a couple years ago. i think it was 19 i came through and i, I picked up a shirt when you still had the uh the the storefront part of it on the on the street. yeah unfortunately we had to shut that down yeah rent it was getting too high. Just COVID. It was like, it oh, was no yeah, man's land. Yeah. We had riots here. The whole block was burned down. Fuck, that's wild. It was crazy. People were getting shot right in front of my house. Damn. Looting. Like, all these stores got looted. For real. And, like, so that's the strip, and this is my house right here. Yeah, yeah. First house. You bet your ass people were trying to hide here. And so we, me and my guys just sat here with guns, and we would go back and forth to the shop. And Damn. Just It was like, it's still kind of fucked up like that. Like, I tell all the people coming here with Rolexes and shit, you can't wear your shit. Mm -hmm. It's a wow. shit hole, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, Hollywood gone crazy. <laughs> but uh, that's kind of what it was. So I shut the store down. Believe it or not, it was a blessing. Yeah. It was like, oh, wow, I don't need four employees anymore. <laughs> it's just more about the garage again. Because yeah. it kind of took over. Yeah, yeah. It was like, uh, hey, this, you know, my landlord's like, hey, have you know put two bikes in the window and go put your t-shirts in there i was like oh, i yeah, feel like you'd that. start seeing like random like instagram models just rocking your stuff it didn't really have like i mean i'm sure that some of them had like a connection to your brand but it's like yeah, when you we have, have a, we have I, I rent a shop on a weekly for commercials and uh-huh yeah we just did a commercial with like uh, we had to build a bike that they're going to crash they use you know i rent them vintage helmets mm-hmm 
I painted a bunch of helmets. Like it's that kind of shit because you got the studios here. Oh yeah, yeah. You know that's awesome. Like the Staples Center just became this another name, whatever. But they just needed a they had a celebrity singer there, and he's gonna pull up on a scooter on stage. So they're like, "Can you paint a helmet?" There you go. I don't paint helmets, but yeah, I'll paint that helmet because oh, you know it's yeah. a good budget and. And I know how to paint, and I'd use one shot a lot, and it gives me an opportunity to paint. Yeah. So it's fun. We get a lot of stupid jobs like that. We rented to a HBO show for, I don't know, six episodes of True Blood, like, years ago. Mm-hmm. But it was like, they're married to the shop now, so you got this, like, contract where, mm. you know, they can film when they want. But guess what? It's 15 grand a day. Fuck yeah. So I'm waiting for the phone to ring. <laughs> yeah. Because... Come on. Because suddenly I don't have to bill your bike anymore. <laughs> or you can wait. It's, yeah, that's just, awesome. it's, it's easy, so it helps, you know? So that's sad. Like, you know, Do you move. have a connection to somebody in the film industry? Or does yes. that stuff, is it just geographical? No, there, there's a, it's like brokers. It's like we have, I have a location scout who I work okay. with. And yeah, she's, oh, yeah. Her name is Tony Mayer, and they come to her. So she works with the, with yeah. the big dogs. Mm-hmm. And some little small jobs, like where it's like, hey, you know they want to pay cash three hours they want to shoot a model it's Easy. not bad that's at all yeah. Bad. yeah that's, that's awesome, awesome. Yeah, sometimes you know but things lead to different things and, but they know about you and then the, the best is the wardrobe shit I bet you got some stories from that that we'll have to save for the Dallas episode in studio <laughs> you got yeah. some stories from that yeah yeah <laughs> alright always always <laughs> every week it's a new thing but they come, they come with a, with a, they send their uh, fucking wardrobe girls for like commercials and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I collected like jackets and stuff from, sometimes I have to go buy them to use them one time for a shoot. So they'll hire me too to like bring, to make them look period correct. Uh, now they're not doing any of that anymore. Like there's not, like the cafe racer thing's gone, but yeah. mm-hmm. it was a big thing for a while. Like every model wore a fucking leather vintage motorcycle jacket. Yeah, yeah. And the jeans, and I would tell them like, do it right. like. Yeah. those look like you know you gotta wear the right shit it's funny like we've worked with them all even like vans and all that skateboarding sh- shit That's it goes hand in hand it's weird you don't it think really about does, it yeah. but these guys do a commercial and it's like anything to do with cars or bikes they hit up all these shops they need props they need down to like I said the jackets the helmets all those vintage helmets mm-hmm. I keep those from jobs cause like when they need them they, I can rent a helmet for a thousand bucks a day no one would pay a hundred bucks for it that's why I'm a hoarder though it's like the shit's all like props oh that makes sense yeah, yeah. I mean like I said shooting anything like I, I'm I feel bad now because I want to go shoot stuff at your shop and I feel like I, hey man can I do it for free <laughs> oh you talk to my agent <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, yeah she's you know she's strong but lately it's been since COVID and all that I'm like we don't even no one everyone's under the table cash yeah make it easier <clears throat> in and out yeah no but feel free to shoot whatever you want please <laughs> cool. I have more toys in the back if I need to pull That's out my, my old knuckleheads and stuff it's in the shed no I, I don't want to take but, up too much no, I don't want to take I don't want to you know yeah. overdo it but like if you do and there's like a cool collection of bikes I have oh, yeah. I appreciate that I have like that. a 1926 board track racer a knucklehead in there a K model I have an old um, Arlen S. Digger. Oh, shit. Just cool shit, but I keep it away from there. Right now, this is all working oh, money yeah, bikes. Yeah. <clears throat> but maybe another time. And, sure, man. And, dude, listen, we're we're all, like, waiting for, like, this weekend, but I don't know what you're doing after or maybe if there's time before. Definitely stop by again. There's a couple hours here and there I could take. Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. I, I'm I want a- you to get whatever content you need and um, to yeah. follow. I'm a like I said. I also like my wife's from here, so I come back quite quite often. So uh, whether I'm driving with her or just what part here at LA. Uh, she's from Santa Clarita, and oh, then shit. Her, like her aunt lives in uh, in uh, Venice Beach, and her dad lives in Tustin. And is that where you're staying in Venice? Yeah, yeah. Right. Is off. she here too? Yeah, she, oh. since '74. No, no, but no, my wife on a here. trip no, with you. No, no, not on this one. And she can't handle the bike that long. <laughs> So it's just you two, on the, yeah, on, well, as far as the riding goes. We started with uh, eight of us, and in Boise, the other homies went back to Texas, and we went back to California. Did you talk to Jeff Wright? Uh uh-uh. Do you know him? I've heard of him. Okay. Yes, he's over there in Boise. Yeah, he's building some crazy shit right now. Yeah, I think I'll introduce you to him if you want. Yeah, I think uh, you know he's like a, he's like a, more than an influencer. 
Oh, yeah. He, wasn't uh, Mike Taylor talking about him some? Yeah, I think so. Kirk Taylor. Kirk Taylor, sorry. Yeah, mm-hmm. Kirk Taylor was talking about We did a podcast with him. Well, there. when I think of Boise, I think of him. Yeah, yeah. But we also, you know, Brian, you know Brian from TPJ, right? Uh, yeah. So we stayed at his house. Uh, He's an old friend. Great friend of mine Good for a dude. while. I like took that us guy. up, took us to an okay Mexican joint. <laughs> okay, <laughs> he thought it was good. Did you taste it twice? <laughs> kinda, kinda. No, it was good. I'm just fucking up. Me and him have a shit talking relationship together, where he says some shit on Instagram and then I clap back and we go back and forth, and then we in hug. a loving way. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. okay. It's all it's all friends. <clears throat> yeah. He's been on the podcast many times, and uh, uh, he's supposed to be flying out to the do the studio one one day. He's just you know, he didn't want to fly with a mask on, which I get it. You know I don't I fucking hate that shit too. Oh wait, is that still happening? No, oh. not anymore. Okay. So it's over with now. But I just committed to a flight today, and I'm like. Fuck. <laughs> I know th- I don't have a vax, so I have to go. Yeah, I don't either. Fuck all that noise. My fake one's been working for a while. <laughs> Mine too, dude. I, I went to New York. But I think I it's like, now it won't, right? Because it's like going no into different countries and shit. Well, I, th- I don't think they even require that shit anymore. But I mean, I think it might be a going to different countries, but you know, as far as like. You got kids? Yeah, I got a 20 year old and a 12 year old. 20 year old? God damn. Yep. Stayed at her house on the way out from leaving Dallas. She put me up. <laughs> I love that. You? Nope. Nope. Not yet. Not yet. Careful out here. <laughs> Girls are like dudes now, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's oh, the opposite. Seen, they pick seen, up on you now. Oh, okay, that. Yeah, we saw some dude girls too. Oh, like, yeah, dudes oh, are like oh girls that's too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, them, them, them. them. <laughs> Yeah, man. Well, let's cut this short because yeah. uh, I do I do want to um, continue to talk and I want to show you all the shit, but I think maybe we should do a part two or something later. Oh, yeah, for sure, man. I kind of... Yeah. These fools are driving me crazy right oh, now. Dude, Everybody wants good. their shit by Friday. I, I'm, I'm on the same page with you, dude. Let's, let's wrap it up. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank you. everything. I've been a big fan for a long time. It's great to finally sit down and talk to you. And uh, I'm a big fan of you now. Oh, I appreciate that. I, but I'm, I'm going to listen to your shit. <laughs> thank you thank you i appreciate it but the thing with podcasts i have to put ear earplugs because like yeah because yeah, yeah. at the shop it's like you can't, i can't be distracted and i don't work then i'm like fuck i'm standing by the speaker so that's i gotta find works, a way man. to work and listen to it that's how you do it man put them on and uh i'll give you some good ones to start with so you don't judge me okay <laughs> yeah please send me the, yeah, the sure. obviously because yeah i want i want the ones that you feel are like yeah yeah there's i think the ones you'll appreciate more so all right all right good appreciate night it. thank you Yo, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I really had a great time talking to you, Neve. Uh, I've been a big fan of theirs for many years. And um, the day before we did this podcast, I was at Tulane Life and we were finishing up that one and uh, had a couple other cancellations with podcasts and just kind of reached out and shot my shot with uh, with Neve and he was able to free up some time and sit down and do this. And so I'm uh, very thankful for that. Had a great time hanging out at his shop, uh, meeting his, uh, his old lady, his, his employees and I guess this shop hang around uh, pretty great story there man had a great time uh, we're starting to get close to the end of a lot of these uh, podcasts that we got in California we still have three left I believe and I'm pretty stoked about releasing them and um, yeah it's gonna be another we have to do another run somewhere to get some more content like this so if you guys enjoy this and enjoy us being able to do this hitting up our patreon and supporting our sponsors is going to be how we can do more of this so if you uh, want to get unreleased content and support the podcast and patreon is a great place to do so and join our little situation over there five dollars or ten dollars a month uh, you get access to all the podcasts that we do and uh, soon more things like live streams and things like that on there so check it out there's links in the description of this podcast also don't forget about our sponsors we have a lot of really great ones on there that uh they all got something that you could use 100 percent promise you you could so check them out great offer codes great opportunities to work with great brands and uh, whatnot there so anyway thanks we're gonna be back next week which will be next month and uh, we got basani exhaust coming up next so you guys stay tuned peace